welcome back uh boyos uh this is another episode of tales from the slide deck yeah uh which is our tentative name i think this is the first episode where we really decided on a name and you might be seeing a bad ai generated graphic on your screen now who knows maybe we'll come up with something better if we get more money we'll pay an artist and that artist will probably be ryan yeah (laughs) i'd like to see what you could do zach (laughs) Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm Ryan. I'm the one speaking right now. Uh, this is, this is an episode I've put together, uh, with me are, are my co-hosts, uh, Zach. Oh, that's me. I'm speaking now. Uh, uh and, uh, yeah. And then to, to my right is Taylor. Hey, that's me. I'm the guy that's speaking right now. Oh my God. This is my voice. To your right. You, he's really like 1000 miles to your west. <laughs> Yeah, That's true. I guess it but, depends on where you're oriented, you know. As far as we're this both a can- thousand miles to your west, I am two feet to your to his right. Oh yeah, no, I could spit on Taylor. This is an episode where I probably will be putting some like, hey, just generic trigger warnings of X, Y, and Z uh, in the description of this. Doctor Squatch, still feel free to give us this. Yeah, money. probably not a great it. episode mm-hmm. to, to eat a shit ton of shrimp to, which I'm glad neither of you seem to be munching on prawns or Panda Express, like you said. Is I mean, this going to change my opinion on shrimp? Possibly. Oh, I got I got two pounds in the fridge I'm not, right I'm not, now. I'm not trying I'm not trying to ruin shrimp for you, bud. <laughs> but I did I did pick this again a Nancy Drew title of you know the Hardy Boys and the Progeny of the Shrimp. I like uh, it. I like this Transformers title. <laughs> oh, Transformers Six: Progeny of the Shrimp. <laughs> it would it would that's it's too grammatic. Like it's too like correct to be a Transformers title. It'd be like Transformers oh, yeah. Progeny Shrimp. <laughs> like Dark of Moon. Ooh, look at that! That's look at John that's fucking Madden as I live and breathe. Look at that! Boom! Here's a shrimp. Uh, you, gotta, you gotta have a big shrimp right All there. All right, Boom. I just, I just, I just had to get one out of the way, just, just to know how this pen tool works. Because hey, this is also the first episode we can actually draw. Thank Boom. you, thank you, Google Slides for Thanks entering for your shit together. the twentieth century. Or yeah, telecast. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's get into this uh, progeny of the shrimp. What oh. the fuck's this episode about? Uh, oh my god, we are so deep. Welcome, welcome I to high school never physics that chemistry. This would go to where we have freaking numbers and letters and little atoms on a screen. But a we, more confusing periodic table. We have to at least get through the baseline of: Do you know uh, what an, an atomic reaction is? What nuclear fission is? Yes, or, okay. because we will we will get into the distinction between fission and fusion. Yeah, no, uh, which was I thought super it was a data confusing. data thing. No, fission and fusion are two different things that are very similar, uh, uh, which I actually had no idea what the distinction was until I started doing research for this. And it's so simple, stupid. It's like the mm-hmm. stalactite, you know, because mm-hmm. it has a T. It's on top sort of a deal. <laughs> fission is like a fissure. You are, you are taking atoms and you are smashing them together to break them apart. Yes. Fusion is you're taking atoms and hitting them at one another to hopefully combine them into other things. You're going to make two atoms fuck, and hopefully they're going to make a different atom baby. <laughs> Yes. Out of the process. Both, both tend to create an unstable chain reaction. And if you can control that energy, then you have nuclear power, nuclear weapons, and all that other stuff. Simple. Simple stuff. Who needs who needs 18 years of college and a yeah, doctorate I think I to got figure it. this out? My brother. <laughs> yeah, me. Of course, your brother. Nerd. Uh, Dr. Ro- Dr. Roberts, shout out to you. Is he really a doctor? Yeah. Oh, shit. He has a PhD in physical chemistry. Dr. Roberts. You got, unfortunately, to my co-hosts and dear listeners at home, they got the dumb one. Um, Great uh, band this, name. Great metal band name. This is my, my nuclear weapons Whoa. and tests episode. All right. Uh, I will be using as chapter headers uh, uh, images from the book uh, Our Friend the Atom, which was done by Disney illustrators. Really? Uh, it's also a... Sh- was also a Disney short made in the 50s that has a lot of art in a similar style. So but, uh, I love Dr. Manhattan uh, hanging out between those two eyes. Yeah, we got Dr. Manhattan hanging out between some eyes. Uh, my personal favorite is is uh, this person who appears to be melting out of a bunch of shapes. But, you know, he's drinking iodine out of a wine glass, so you know he's okay. I love that font. Or, I love that Breakfast at Tiffany's ass font. Metals Alive is also a funny one because it's like, oh, buddy, 
buddy, I just want to slap that hand. Get, no, don't touch that. Dog, you got you already have hand cancer. <laughs> Dog, they're they're naming a disease after you. Put, <laughs> put that down. Put that down. Uh, but people on top in the future are gonna have Steve Johnson syndrome. Our friend the Adam, though, as a book, uh, is also broken up into sections uh, treating atomic energy as sort of uh, they they call it the atomic genie. And you ask the atomic genie for three wishes, in essence, of, of what, what you're going to get out of this power. Our first wish is for power. Okay. Always. Uh, simply, how can, we, how can we harness this, uh, you know, this... How can these little guys charge my iPhone? Basically, yes. How how can we how can we take enough of these little guys, these atoms, you know, and basically power uh, a power plant? I love um, the skit where there's the guy that's learning about nuclear power, but he has an iPhone already. <laughs> how do I, how I feel can like, I use this yeah. to charge my my phone? Someone needs to give this Arabian Prometheus an iPhone. This will be a much more relatable image. <laughs> <laughs> we'll Photoshop one in. Um, our story starts as some do in Chicago, the University of Chicago, uh-huh. the U- at the University of Chicago. Uh, Enrico Fermi is an Italian physicist, uh, guy born, raised in Italy, climbs up the rank, uh, making great strides in his uh, 20s and 30s. Is he uh, uh, the a, constructor of the world's largest Jenga set? Is that where we're looking at? Uh, yeah, we'll we'll get to spicy Jenga okay. over that here. That is an, a very spicy <laughs> Jenga set. Uh, Fermi basically sees the writing on the wall. Uh, he's still living in Italy. Uh, he gets out with his wife in like 1938 because they start passing uh, very anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish laws. His Things wife, get a little fascist. Yeah, you unlike, know, unlike today in America. Well, no, of well, where does that end Europe. up going? Did they <laughs> did they put a stop to that? At Never some point? again. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it just it's something we don't even know about. Uh, but he takes all this uh, knowledge he has and is uh, attempting. He hears what like Germany's doing, which they're making some breakthroughs and putting spicy rocks next to other spicy rocks and getting some power output. Like, how can we make energy or kill people with how these can, spicy rocks? How can we make these rocks spicier? How can we how can we do something? And uh, uh, in the basement of the University of Chicago, it, it takes Fermi uh, four years. It takes him all the way until 1942 to construct what is called the Chicago Pile, yep. uh, the world's spiciest Jenga set that you have the angriest man, <laughs> the angriest looking man having to touch the spicy Jenga Well, you set. see, the Sox he were playing that night, that. and I had tickets <laughs> with my old lady to go down and watch the Sox play, but now I'm touching the spicy rocks, so. Zach, you are uh, maybe unknowingly accurate. The University of Chicago is not that far away from where the White Sox play. It's in South Chicago. Uh, I know. I've stared at Google Maps for <laughs> about a decade, buddy. I, I have walked past this uh, particular spot because Dr. Roberts' alma mater is the University mm. of Chicago. No so I'd, I'd, hoped, I'd hoped you've seen some pictures or placards. They or have something. a statue of like the atomic structure gotcha. to, uh, to m- commemorate the spot where the pile was built. Yeah. I do like the the unassuming name of the Chicago Pile because mm-hmm. that yeah. does that does sound like what I leave in a public restroom after I've had a deep dish. Pizza. I, trust me, that statue wasn't the only thing commemorating the Chicago Pile that I saw in, in South Chicago during that trip. Uh, but yeah, uh, these are blocks of uh, graphite. Uh, some of them are hollowed out, and you have some uranium in there. I don't know if they were fucking too much with plutonium at the time. But he just like uh, started building a fire of different metals. Well, just like bit by bit, you kind of put like, in a uh, gra- graphite. Get yourself graphite's- a little uranium. Get yourself a little plutonium. Get well, yourself a little graphite. Well, uh, that's that's a little that's a spicy reaction when you put some uranium next to uranium. Okay, we'll put some graphite around that and kind of contain that and see how much uranium we can bounce off of shit. Uh, this also, I believe, has cadmium rods going through it, which act like a sponge for a lot of these uranium uh, atoms. So. I love boiling this down to just rocks, too. Like, this is making the job I'm trying sound, to make this I, as simple, I, stupid as I can. I love it. I love it. Because that's what they're doing, right? I mean, they're in their white smocks and everything, and they're writing stuff down with numbers and letters. But really, they're just putting rocks next to other rocks, aren't we, guys? They only get a half watt. I mean, this thing ends up being about, uh, I think, 14 what? to 17 feet tall. But they get half a watt of energy out of it. Barely anything, but enough for the tests to be somewhat uh, 
proven as we, we can make concept. this. Yeah, we can yeah. make this happen. Uh, and this is the first, our first exposure to this kind of thing of creating energy from outs- outside of what the Germans were doing. But Germans it, were trying to fuck with heavy water. Uh, I guess I shouldn't say this is uranium. our first, but this is a very monumental moment in, in the mechanics of nuclear power. Yeah. This... Uh, yeah. This is where things go from like kind of the theoretical to like the oh shit like oh we can make is, it happen. This is tangible. Uh. Uh, it is also worth noting. I mean, this this thing comes up, I believe, in December of 1942. Which, if if you're a fan of your old 90s, early 2000s history channel, you know 1942 is kind of like a landmark year. Shit's been popping off. Yeah. Everything's not looking so great for the Axis powers in 1942. Uh, Oh, you had a Pearl Harbor at the end of 1941 by 42, like Japanese Navy is pretty much fucked. Like they don't, they don't have air superiority anymore in the Pacific. Uh, you have Germany failing at Stalingrad. I was going to say the Jerry's went to, went to Moscow and it didn't go well for them. It didn't go well for them. And then they tried to throw in the, the right hook into Stalingrad got caught up in that things aren't looking great for Germany. Italy is about to be invaded in 43, uh, with, with the huge force, it's 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 that turning point and this is just one of those dominoes that is that turning point uh for the world at that time uh like but multiple world powers have been racing for this for about three years oh or absolutely three or four years at this point because i think it was what uh that nobel presentation by uh first name slips my mind marie curie's daughter and her yeah. husband was like either 1938 or 1939 and that basically sparked like everyone's like oh fuck like, if you can create energy, you can create a weapon out of it. We have to be first to have a weapon. And and it's 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 viewed somewhat as a novelty, but at the same time, there is, in essence, a, a race between nations. Because mm-hmm. it's, you know, if, if we can create a controlled burst of energy big enough, this replaces gunpowder. This, replaces you know, everything. It, re- it replaces everything. Mm-hmm. It's it's a whole it's a whole new game on top of what uh, what you're already playing. I do like Fermi. Uh, if we're, I don't know if we're going to talk much more about him, but he's uh, he's also a, a extreme pessimist. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I mean, he fucked Alone. around with so much so much stuff other than just uh, creating the pile and being sort of the father of atomic energy. Uh, he delved into. Not astrophysics, but he is he is why we have a Fermi paradox. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you've guy. heard of that, Zach. I have not. Uh, Fermi paradox uh, was uh, uh, sort of a concept of his that he'd been toying if around. There's and infinite, if there's you know, infinite stars out there that could have infinite planets and infinite possibilities of life, mm-hmm. where is everybody? And Fermi oh. was the one proposed that... Well, if somebody can gain the, you know, if some species can gain the sentience that we essentially have, they probably end up destroying themselves before they can spread and make their yeah. presence known. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. I've, I have heard of that. I never knew that it had, it had a name to it. Well, now, now you got a balding face to it here with, with Alan Tudyk, who should play him in some movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, but when the folks of the Manhattan Project were like taking bets on like what was going to happen during the Trinity tests, like oh yeah, he was solidly in the camp of like oh we're gonna blow the fucking world up. Yeah, and he said it half as a joke, but but when, he put when, money on it. But he's but yeah, he <laughs> did put money on it, and he was somewhat serious about that. Uh, speaking of Manhattan Project, uh, we we're, we're going to get into that, but I I really want to at least early in this reinforce. How does nuclear bomb work? Because we okay. know putting spicy rocks next to spicy rocks creates some energy. So how do you compress that energy? Much like, you know, if you have a pile of black powder on the ground and you light it, 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 it releases some energy, but you wrap that in paper and you have a firecracker. You put it in a, a metal barrel, you can now project a, a you can now send lead yeah. through the air at incredible speed. Uh, and, and similar concept with a nuclear bomb, you have... You have very spicy elements. I like to think of this as like warhead candy, mm-hmm. in yeah. a way. Yeah, I where, mean... where you have you have spicy elements surrounded by eh, other spicy elements that are then inside other spicy elements, mm-hmm. and then you put high explosives all around it that all detonate at once. The quickest way to get those spicy rocks touching one another is to. Essentially, compress it with an explosion. Very fast, yeah. Very fast, mm. and in, and this was all in concept. 
until a Manhattan Project happened. I mean, nobody, as much as Fermi was saying, yeah, we're going to blow up the world, there were other people putting money on this. This isn't going to do anything. You're just going to have, you know, this plutonium basically go critical and that's it. You've, you've released energy, but we're you gonna, don't have an explosion. We're going to ruin a part of New Mexico. Yeah. Which they did. They did. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> New Mexico. Uh, Los Alamos. Good right? old Los Alamos. Uh, piece of land uh, that did not have a whole lot of use. Wasn't great for farming. No. Kind of out of the way from major cities. Uh, regardless, I almost made the joke of just saying, like, you know who the fuck this is, rather than a J. Robert Oppenheimer, because... Uh, uh, very important and integral, yes, to this, but he sort of becomes the figurehead celebrity face of what's happening in the Manhattan Project when there are there are countless men, women. Yeah, Enrico Fermi's there. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, mm-hmm. other physicists, but you you have uh, a dedication from people from all walks of life, civilian, military, scientists. Yeah, FDR uh, got about like two thousand scientists together, gave a speech. And basically said, like, if you want in, you can get in on this project. You mm-hmm. know, if not. Yeah, after they founded the office in Manhattan, which yeah. is where the project gets its name. Uh, and then the race is fucking on to, like, everyone needs to figure out, like, okay, you can make weapons out of this, sh- like, nuclear energy shit. Uh and so, like, people who were, were in attendance there that were Americans, like, knew, like, we need to get back to America, and we need to get a hold of people that can get a hold of the president to, like, mm-hmm. convince them that, like, we need to be working on this. And it's very convincing. A, lo- a lot, and there's not just the uh, monetary side of things where, where people go, okay, I can get now a ton of money to, to continue my research, you know, through this path. There are a lot of people who are very dedicated on... If, if we can make something that ends this conflict in some form or fashion or, or gives America a leg up, then uh, how, what's the worst that could happen? There were a lot of naive people that thought, like, if we make a weapon so terrible, if we make a gun big enough, we'll end all war. Mm. And as long like as we have it first... We'll end all wars. The problem, like, you know, the, you know, hey, if if there if you just keep making bigger guns, inevitably people will not be incentivized to, like, you know, get into conflicts with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, one interesting because, I mean, there's uh, Manhattan Project only it lasts about three years mm-hmm. until the Trinity test. Uh, but during that time, there's a lot <clears throat> of research and development. There's a lot of fucking around and people just throwing blue sky ideas, whatever spaghetti can stick at the wall. Uh, one of those is uh, we got we got good old Fermi here. Hey, he's who back. we know. He's we back. Got, we got eyebrows O'Houlihan. And we got yeah. we got Teller over here. We got uh, tall Fedora McKenzie. And, and, uh, his name's Hey, Ulam. didn't that guy uh, uh, rob the house in Home Alone? <laughs> <laughs> With a tall guy, yeah. <laughs> uh, but Whatever we make for the Trinity test, whatever first atomic bomb, will essentially be the fuse for a larger atomic bomb. Oh. Yeah, you put a bomb to set off the bigger bomb. Yeah. So we're doing a big practice of the bomb that will set off the bigger bomb. Uh, But there are concepts of, do we drop it? Because you have airdropped ordnance and you have ground ordnance. And to get a maximum bang for your buck, you're dropping the thing from the air and you're exploding it a couple thousand feet up because mm-hmm. explosions happen in spheres and you want all that energy to dissipate out as far out as possible to get the most boom out of your bomb. Increase your, increase your blast radius. But with a lot of these tests, uh, they are ground ordnance. Uh, this is uh, the gadget here on the left, which is what they called uh, the bomb that would be used in the Trinity test. Uh, I I love this fucking wow. retro retro future. Ass. <laughs> a lot of XLR cables in there, boys. <laughs> Guy, uh, guys, I think I do. We plug it into monitor. Or do we plug it into aux? <laughs> like, uh, but this is uh, the essentially the drop tower for. I mean, it's not even going to drop the bomb, but uh, it's where the bomb was stationed, only a couple hundred feet above the ground, just because. Well, if we're testing this thing out, just have it on the ground, set it off. Uh, but regardless, uh, on July sixteenth, nineteen forty-five, uh, the Trinity test goes off. 
uh, without any sort of, I mean, it, it exceeds expectations, especially when you had people betting on it's just going to be a dud and just create a nuclear reaction and not an explosion. I mean, you had people all over the place. You had people who also thought that, like, this was going to cause a chain reaction and, and burn off all of Earth's atmosphere oh, yeah. and kill everyone. This was going to mm-hmm. either end the world or do nothing or something in between. And the in between was very impressive. Money so. was with the in betweens. <laughs> uh,. Uh, but yeah, we, we have Trinity only a few milliseconds after detonation, uh, with this nice, beautiful bubbly looking thing right up top. And that is essentially a miniature sun. It's insane to think with camera technology that someone was able to capture that specific image Yeah, and not using like, what is it? Like the, the phantom, uh, that like super high speed camera that YouTubers use nowadays. Well that, and you also have to think of a film camera. Uh-huh. Yeah, you have you have so many film cameras set up to basically boom, 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 boom go off. But you, you have know, to have like a matrix rig of cameras mm-hmm. to even have like even the slightest outside possibility of capturing mm-hmm. that particular photo. Not it's, to mention, it, it's like you can't be super close to it either when it's going off. So you have to have quite a heavy lens and know exactly where it's going to be dropped so you can focus in on it too from that from that far away. It's very impressive. Uh, it makes a slight crater. Uh, of course, the tower's gone. If if somebody what? left their willy, if somebody left their yeah, that willy Willy's jeep, jeep that <laughs> no, it's 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 rolling over in heaven's ditches now. If somebody mm-hmm. left uh, their wallet there, it's winding up somewhere in New York City. <laughs> Uh, Somehow, conveniently far uh, away from the second tower. It's a very impressive display. Again, much like a Chicago pile, you have your proof of concept sort of beating expectations. You know, it's it's uh, even though the explosion is it's it's large. I mean, we're going to get to this. Nuke what? map. When is did they such do a, that? When did that happen? <laughs> Nuke map is such a wonderful resource uh, for it. me to kind of visualize. So uh the size and scale of these and you can put in whatever city you would like but i uh, we all know seattle Mm -hmm. we've all gone around seattle so we all kind of have a a general idea of like the extent of one of these one of the few times it pays to be in west seattle (laughs) uh, (laughs) nuke nuke map also doesn't take a lot of things in consideration doesn't take in uh, elevation Mm. uh anything like that it just sort of treats google maps as a flat plane that this thing is exploding on and also some of its metrics are a little bit wonky just because you're outside of this furthest uh shaded area here doesn't exactly mean that you're safe uh, yeah, you're definitely not safe if it, like West Seattle is not like oh everyone gets to live their lives super happy and uh, health complication free. Yeah, uh, but I, typically I think they have like buildings there that would also be projected outward to everywhere else outside. Yeah. What, what circle represents just immediately vaporized? Uh, immediately Ooh, vaporized. Yellow. Uh, yellow is fireball. Red is immediately vaporized. Yeah. Uh, you drop this Seattle center. I drop this just. I just pick Seattle, so it's okay. it's dropping it actually. If we have Pike Place oh, Market, no, no, it's no, dropping it's it a little bit south. So it's dropping it just you're in, in downtown. You're in, you're in uh, yeah, this is like town. You, you dropped like, it on a Wajamaya. <laughs> uh, Pi- I was going to say Pioneer <laughs> Square, but yeah. Uh, but uh, red is your source of like, uh, you're, you're getting 1,000, 2,000 degree uh, blast wave from that. You are, your shadow is preserved on the side of a building. Oh, yeah. It's made of oh, solid enough material. Not, we'll like, get to that. Over. We'll get to the bombs that were dropped on uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima right. later in this episode. Uh, but it is important to note that those are actually less of a yield than the Trinity test had. They're more of like a production line. Okay, we don't, we don't need to have so many XLR cables. We don't cables. need to go that hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but even then, they were still testing uh, weapons platforms while while doing that, which is something we'll get into. Um, the immediate aftermath of the Trinity test, uh, mind you, because of secrecy uh, in all this and not wanting it to get out, even though information did get out to different espionage oh, yeah. outlets. Um, but the public, the public of New Mexico has no idea that the Trinity test even happened until the bomb drops on Hiroshima about... Half a month later, mm-hmm. so, so there's 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 a twenty day period where you got dudes going to the bar saying, "I know what I saw. I saw a big ass mushroom cloud." Oh, 
uh, the uh, the army in the area releases a statement saying like, hey, we had a munitions depot blow up. If you happen to see a really bright light, you know, in the morning, but hey, nobody got hurt. Everything's fine. You know, uh, we ladies and gentlemen, there was a whoopsie. Uh, but basically, uh, and, and it's hard to tell cause I'm going to show a couple graphs in this and it's hard to tell exactly again, what a rad is because, uh, different types of radiation affect the body differently, Okay. but it's safe to assume, uh, you have a cloud of radioactive dust, debris, silica, sand, rocks that are thrown, caught by the wind, mm -hmm. and then land in populated areas. Yeah, those, goes up, those go up pretty high up into the atmosphere and yeah. up into the jet streams where they can carry quite a distance. So you have essentially 20 days of people who are having their crops dusted by radioactive material. Uh, even into the modern day, uh, they're called downwinders. Uh, there are people still fighting to get some sort of medical compensation and recognition Whoa. that that uh from that their grandparents being irradiated their by grandparents the or the people who are still alive you know yeah if you were like eight years old you'd now be in what like your late 80s yeah. early 90s. and all you did was eat an orange on july 18th or whatever that would happen to be grown in this region happen to be grown or just sitting out yeah because again this this dust you know it, it lands anywhere it doesn't just land on the food being grown. It lands on your produce trucks and stands on the side of the road and, wow. and everything else. Uh, but yeah, I, I believe there was some efforts to get uh, the downwinders recognized sometime in the 2010s. But then I believe those benefits have ended as of the present date. Man, they barely funded like medical like coverage for first responders on 9-11. So, oh, yeah. No, it's like America yeah, has a very old people who are all going to die in the next 10 years anyway. Like exactly. that, we're not going to spend that money. We could spend it on, you know, Raytheon <laughs> or other pet projects. Uh, but it is important noting uh, we, we brought up. You know, your air detonation of nuclear weapons and your ground detonation. Uh, one of the problems with ground detonation is you are flinging up much more of this dust and debris that gets caught up in the wind. Really? And uh, and even though uh, it's, it's, again, each nuclear test is different depending on the elements that they used. And even then, if you were to set up two bombs that are similar... But just a slight change of the wind, slight little yeah. bit of elevation, slight different soil composition. You have wildly different results. Uh, the Trinity test is uh, ends up being a dirtier bomb, in essence, than the Fat Man uh, and Little Boy bombs that we ended up dropping on Japan. Well, we, we popped off a few more of those boys yeah. before we uh, decided to go totally necessarily end world war ii with those two nuclear weapons it was it was totally necessary to drop those we didn't just do it to send a message to the rest ruskies oh, we're getting to that taylor taylor have you read my notes no taylor I, taylor I have just you watched, read my notes? i also just watched a lot of history channel back in the day i mean all this is fairly general knowledge but i would feel bad not including uh, a lot of this stuff you gotta you gotta build your story. foundation yeah yes. these are some good photos of sad farmers I, I like that you included i didn't oh yeah i didn't think of much about the tests. i mean the, every the single one of, of the tests Oh, every single one of these uh, farmers up in the top right are migrant workers. Yeah, they all got deported after World War II. Uh, there was a huge uh, influx of migrant workers into New Mexico in the 40s. Because uh, the boys were off fighting in the war. Yes, Somebody yes. had to do the farming. Uh, and that's also not even taking into account uh, the people that were relocated to make the Los Alamos. Because mm -hmm. while, while it wasn't the most fertile land, it you know there's there's a ongoing kind of history and precedent of like well if we're gonna do nuclear tests in an area we we gotta God sorry so, hundred thousand people sorry <laughs> sorry this is this is our land now yeah. you know like we're, 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 we're moving out ladies and gentlemen well, you've been imminent domain uh, especially we don't in be bad neighbors and like set a nuclear bomb off in your backyard i mean so oh, you might as well not. just skedaddle so get on out of yeah. here folks yeah don't don't put any pins in that at all zach not none whatsoever <laughs> <laughs> um uh but uh almost immediately once the bomb uh, once the trinity test was uh, a success uh you basically have this race how quickly can we get two bombs uh to uh 
islands that we have taken off the shore of Japan. Get that shit to the Pacific. How how quick can we get this shit to the Pacific? Uh, one of those trips, and I don't know if it had both or if it just had the Fat Man, but we we all know the Indianapolis because mm-hmm. we all know that damn Jaws story. Hell yeah! And we all know that you know it. Five hundred men go into the water. Closing. I mean, you don't know you're in the closing right. act of World War II. But essentially, you have this top secret mission, haul ass, get to these islands in the Pacific on your boat. Uh, you have strict instructions of if anything happens to this boat, don't... D- men be damned. Get this bomb on a life raft no matter what. Make sure this bomb is like the sole survivor of this ship. Uh, and after delivering its cargo, the Indianapolis... Uh, it gets torpedoed. It gets torpedoed, goes down. Uh, 500 men go in the water. <laughs> Only like three come out. <laughs> like a doll size. Uh, but uh, this was interesting because this actually uh, picture on the left is a part of the rescue of the oh, Indianapolis. Oh, these survivors. are the poor, the poor This fox. isn't just people, you know, this isn't just military men on a boat. Uh, there's shark. a fucking shark. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, there's a legit, right there, there's multiple sharks you can see in this picture, but definitely one here. Uh, absolutely terrible. Yeah. If you're one of those dudes in that raft, you've been sitting there for like at least three days, just listening to dudes that like, Oh, you work with just get fucking eaten by sharks. Or screams, like, then quiet, then more like screams. Days. Hold up. Let's run, let's run this whole story back after it dropped the bomb, the bombs off on the secluded Island. It got torpedoed. Well, you, st- you still yes, have the well, you Navy. still have a period of a couple days when bombs are on an island off of Japan, mm-hmm. and people are figuring out how do we get bomb to Japan. They're looking at maps, just <laughs> lost. You a bunch have of men you have oh, you have a, Japan a, from here. <laughs> you have a, a plane, <laughs> a really big, a truck with really big tires. We'll put uh, it in a mascot. We'll who, put it in a mascot. Who played quarterback in high school? <laughs> See it, if we can whip can we that put it shit in an over there. And send it you via the USPS. <laughs> Dear Japan. <laughs> Dear Japan. From Happy Uncle Sam birthday. and the boys. Can we dress it up like a lady and, and send it off into the middle of Tokyo? <laughs> they build a Can we really give the bomb horse. like a leg? They, bring, <laughs> they build a really big horse and just walk to the front gate of Japan and knock three times. The one, the one gate of Japan. The yes. one gate of Japan. Story, I just wanted to clarify, time. though, also that so anyway, those story. are the two boys, hey, right? I mean... Those are the two boys. Those are our two boys. Yeah. No, we got, we got our, our aptly named little boy uh, and our fat man. Uh, on the right, uh, Fat Man is basically uh, a scaled down version of the Trinity test in a much fancier box. It's almost mm. a sphere. Uh, our little boy bomb is a little bit different. Rather than having all the explosions uh, cylindrical kind of around it, uh, the little boy bomb actually has like a piece of uranium that is launched on a rail system towards yeah. the plutonium. Because they're trying things out. They don't know. They're they're still throwing spaghetti <laughs> they're at the wall. still beta even. testing this whole power thing. We, we basically dropped the iPod <laughs> and the iPod mini on Japan Fun. in the same, like, t- day. Uh, Taylor. Mm-hmm. That's not, Charlie Brown. Not technically a technical. God. It is. It is. It is a military chassis. I'm about to say, I don't see an engine on that. Anywhere, uh, I believe. But... I believe there is a. Uh, I believe this is towed. I believe it's a trailer. Yeah. But still, you you could push it down a hill. I mean, there, there it has to be able to propel itself. Oh, okay. to be a technical. Oh, okay. Well, that Here that I looks was... like a nuclear bomb to me, and it could propel itself if it so desired, <laughs> sir. I mean, if we included like the truck that's towing it, yeah, it's a technical. I would say. Okay. Okay. Uh, I do this. Just this cart with a bomb <laughs> welded onto a cradle. Uh, I can't I would, wait for I this to be a war not thunder. A technical. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then someone leaks a bunch of fucking military secrets because of it. <laughs> One thing that I do always find interesting about these old photos, and we're going to see a lot more. Uh, you know pacific nuclear shirtless test men. photos shirtless men in the it's, pacific it's, it's, it's shirtless men touching a bomb put oh, some clothes hubba, hubba. On. it's it's angry shirtless uh, men uh, touching a bomb it ain't like a sh- like the shirt's gonna protect you from the mesothelioma that you're probably gonna get from this shit no me so who <laughs> if Never you meta. or a loved one has experienced <laughs> mesothelioma uh yeah so, of course, 
crews are picked for the initial uh, Enola Gay dropping of uh, the little boy bomb on Hiroshima. Uh, the crew is not fully informed as to what they're dropping, but they can figure things out pretty quick. Yeah. Because through the grapevine, America has a new weapon. Mm -hmm. And when you know it, anytime you do like a firebombing raid, and, and even when they were dropping like pamphlets off in Japan, because they would, there were there were uh, American Air Force, well, I guess it's the Army and Navy at that time. It's the Army Air Corps, yeah. Yeah, they would, they would fly over, they would drop leaflets, you know, your give up, surrender sort of deal. And, and a lot of firebombs and as then, well. And then, and then <laughs> those, those would... Those little pamphlets calling them pussy and shit like that. Like, really? Well, <laughs> there would be like, hey, great destruction is coming to your city, mm. and then Typically within a day or less than that, we'd firebomb fire the, the living shit out of the. Uh, so things seem a little bit off for uh, Tibbet here, who is your your just the happiest man on, on a plane. Uh, just <laughs> so long, I didn't fellas. even I didn't even know you could take these windows out, but apparently <laughs> you could take it out to wave. Uh, but. Him yeah, you think it's riveted into the fucking plane by the looks of it. Yeah. He rolled it down. He 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 got the power window option on the plane he named oh, after shit. his mother. Got, he got the limited edition <laughs> yeah. of the B-29 or whatever. But uh, very quickly, they figure out, especially before the plane takes off, they're like, okay, this is weird. We're loading up one bomb. Yeah, we're, we're look behind dozens. them. Wait, there's another bomb? Where did this one Wait, come we're, from? We're, we're just loading one bomb. We're taking out a lot of the extra stuff in a plane that can uh, reduce weight and give it extra uh, mileage on that. Uh, in our pre-flight instructions, it says, after you drop this, flip the quickest bitch you've <laughs> ever fucking flipped and haul all of the ass <laughs> away from wherever, you, like, from Hiroshima. Man, it's also part of why... Uh, the unfortunate uh, sites where the bombs will be dropped weren't necessarily like forewarned uh, because it was one solitary bomber coming. Oh yeah, coming through the Taylor. Morning. You're reading my notes. I'm sorry, Taylor. You're reading. I'm sorry. Da -da 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 uh, yeah, Taylor. I think we're getting to that part. Okay, buddy. We are getting to that part. <laughs> uh, August sixth, we had the little boy bomb dropped on Hiroshima. August 9th. Uh, we have the Fat Man bomb dropped we had on August. Seventy-two on. hours to reflect on the fucking travesty and there that is we caused. So and decided, let's do it again. There is so much shit that happens in this seventy-two hours. Uh, uh, but and Japan wanted to surrender days before this. Oh, Japan's been in negotiations uh, trying to send <laughs> and out. The U.S. Uh, said, "Put a pin in that. Uh, we're gonna, we're going to come back to the table in about three days." Uh, and exactly then we'll, right. We'll, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're no, you, you are you are one hyper. Uh, but yeah, on August sixth, uh, air raid sirens go off uh, because a plane is spotted. They immediately turn off uh, about. Five ten minutes before the bomb is actually dropped, because they go, "Oh, it's just oh, one it's just pl a fucking plane. It's, it's yeah. just it's just one plane. It's not a firebomb. They're probably just dropping leaflets or whatever." Saying, "Hey, we're gonna firebomb the living piss out of you again for the millionth fucking time." Incredible. Mm. I just I like that. I I like that tactic. I mean, this is I'm soaking all of this in. We're we're looking at World War II in such a different light, and I love this, Ryan. But the the Pearl Harbor thing was so interesting because. You you weren't going to get kamikaze was kind of a new idea that you they were not planning to go back. They were going to die plummeting into this thing. And that's like a psychological thing of like, yo, so now we have to think about if there is a fleet coming their 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 naval ships don't have to be close enough to us for them to make a return flight. They're just going to die. And then the same psychological thing of only one plane. Can, they can't do any damage. It's one plane. What's what's the deal with one plane? They will. We could shoot down one plane very easily. It's not going to do much. But now in our 2020 vision eyes, one oh, plane yeah, in hindsight. can do so much damage now in the state in the sake of warfare. In general, it could do so much damage because we have the nuclear weapon now. It's we that war was crazy. That war is insane. We also have to talk about why Hiroshima was selected. Uh, it's selected mostly because it was a ta it was a city that we had not firebombed really throughout the course of the there war. There was some shit left to bomb. Yeah. Well, yeah, the the entire some city infrastructure is up. It is also a uh, it was a central meeting uh, area for a couple different divisions of the army. So that was sort of a justification by the U.S. government and military to be like, okay, well, 
yeah, we don't, you know, estimates are we're going to kill about 20,000 people, but hopefully a lot of them are soldiers. And also uh, no major American POW camps mm. are in the area. Suspected to be in the area. But it's they're... also a manufacturing hub. Yes. So you're going to cripple, like, Japan's already extremely crippled war machine. And yeah, it, it, it's, on the, it's on the shore. It's a port town, isn't it? Hiroshima. Yeah. It's, uh, we'll, we'll bring up a map here okay. shortly. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's lots of different things. Lots of locations are sort of speculated, but Hiroshima, some of the big ones that they pick is, well, we'll be able to observe what this bomb does because this city hasn't really been firebombed. It was yet. kind of the biggest industrial city that we hadn't bombed a shit already. Yes. Nice. Uh, in contrast to something like Nagasaki, but we will, <laughs> we will get to that. Um, I'm on the I, edge of my seat. Again, with Nuke Map, we have our little boy bomb and our fat man, and both are similar in size and yield. Mm. Uh, I, I believe it's like 15 kilotons of TNT and 20 kilotons of TNT, as opposed to the 25 of the Trinity test. Your outer radius is about the same, but your inner radius, like the the bad, like hey, you're this, you're just, you just instantaneously are not existing anymore, yeah. is bigger on Fat Man. And this is also maybe going off of the fact that like. Uh, Trinity mm. was like, hey, we drop it, it hits the ground. Both of these oh, this is This is there. a consequence of something yeah. being exploded a couple you know, thousand feet in the air, so you have a much wider, for your initial what the blast is going to affect, ba- better much bang wider for the buck, area. Yeah. Um, but of course, Ooh. you know, I, as much as I wanted to show before and after Hiroshima, I feel like just seeing the after really just sells the point on there was a city here. There was a city here, and it appears, uh, of course, it's it's not your, uh, it's not like your movies. It's not everything is gone in a big crater. Mm. You can see a lot of your brick and concrete structures are still standing, but you know those have been completely burnt out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In essence, there's zero glass, zero furniture inside, zero people anymore, just ghosts. Also, the whatever the concrete, the brick, whatever was used to make that is now like incredibly brittle yes like it could crumble at any given moment yes not not safe structures at all uh give it up to japanese architecture though you know withstanding a nuclear blast like that bravo yeah Uh, uh, something I was surprised to find, there are a few pictures, uh, none really from Nagasaki, but in Hiroshima, there are a few pictures from people who are miles away who took pictures of the explosion from a ground level, uh, and that's in your bottom right hand here. Also, just insane, the timing of that, like, because, yeah. you know, everyone basically was caught unawares by this, so this was just some guy who was like, hey, somebody who had a, a camera, a picture mm-hmm. of the countryside, or... Mm-hmm. Well, like, ha- I had imagine... a camera close enough at hand to be like, oh, there's still a mushroom cloud in the air. I should get yeah. a picture mm-hmm. of this. Yeah, that's that's what I'm leaning towards is, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people in Japan, so I imagine someone had a camera far enough away that they're like, oh, that cloud had stopped. Boom, that hurt. Now I get to see you, a cloud coming from that direction, too. You get a lot more uh, photos right after the event in Nagasaki because after they, uh, the Japanese government realized that, oh, this this is what a nuclear bomb is. Uh, oh, fuck. They, they were sending... Uh, their photographers out to take the pictures and the story of a couple, like a handful of photographers who went out who died of like radiation exposure and everything, because they're essentially sending them right to there. their death mm-hmm. to, to document what has happened. Yeah. The world doesn't necessarily know what radiation exposure. Oh, does nobody, you, nobody yeah. really knows. Uh, we know that there was a bunch of girls who painted like, uh, what is it? Iridium uh on watches like during the world war one world war two effort oh yeah which is radiation again affects it it's it's unbiased but it affects everybody differently you will have some people uh you know person a person b will be exposed to the same amount of radiation and one dies in two weeks and the yeah. other one gets thyroid cancer five years from them mm-hmm. yeah it's so interesting uh, it's so interesting that yeah it, our bodies all just absorb that information in such different ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're also classic, an image that uh, you all, of course, have seen. The Hiroshima R2-D2. Dome. Yeah. Good old R2-D2 here, uh, which was like a, a trade building, like where people would bring in goods and what have you. It was used somewhat by the military, but uh, its importance is, is it was right underneath 
It was basically like, uh, I think, 100 feet removed from the epicenter of where the bomb was. Yo. So since all the force came from the top down, most of the structure still stands. Yeah, it Mind didn't, you, it didn't every, blow it sideways. Yeah, it didn't blow it sideways. Of course, everyone who's in there is dead. What? No windows. <laughs> They're all ghosts now. Uh, but yeah, uh, the attacks on Hiroshima have killed an estimated... And and we're I mean, your low numbers are American numbers from the 40s, and your high numbers are Japanese numbers from about the 60s, 70s. The right numbers. The right numbers. <laughs> uh, you got 70 to 140 thousand dead, and countless injured just in Hiroshima alone. Yo. Part of that also is 12 American prisoners of war, which is something that America denied all the way up into the 70s and 80s. That's what we're good at, deny and deflect. In fact, it took a Japanese citizen to be like, we should include this in our Hiroshima museum just to be like, no, the Americans also bombed them, you know, bombed their own. Mm -hmm. They bombed citizens? Oh my, oh, what? That does not sound like the United States. Uh... And I hate to be that girl who went backpacking in uh, <laughs> in Europe, but it's like I wouldn't be doing this slideshow if I hadn't visited the uh, the memorials at Hiroshima uh, in my teenage years, which fucking wild experience. Yeah, I, mean, I know I've made the joke before to you, Taylor, but it's the worst Disneyland I've ever been. And it's, <laughs> it's 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 depressing Disneyland. You get to see some real cool scale models of what the city looked like before and after and some artifacts. I, and I can also relate. I, uh, as many of the jokes as we've all ripped, I have been to Ground Zero for 9-11. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it, it is a, you know, it's it, it's an experience to be... Uh, just physically in the location where like such a massive like tragedy had occurred and where like so many people so quickly lost their lives mm-hmm. unnecessarily. Uh, and, and we can all make jokes and get our yucks on this because that's, that's what the what, fuck else are you going to do? Well, if what you aren't fu- laughing, you're crying. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so the people, mm, the human yeah. side of this. Uh, radiation, as we mentioned before earlier, it, it affects everybody differently, and it is essentially, uh, you have immediate injuries from the bomb, and you have things that pick up, that start kicking in weeks later, months later, years later. Uh, as we can see in the middle picture, that is, uh, a person, you can see that there was a man standing with a cane outside these Ooh, steps. Just going about his shit at, like, 8 a.m. in the morning. Who basically just got turned into a charred corpse, dust... Yes. I, there but, isn't but, a corpse. Like this is what remains. Of this is life. what remains. His shadow is what remains. Fathom before the atomic bomb. Like what? How someone could die that way? Right? Like no one's been atomized. Like their whole essence just gone. Everybody's left a body, bones, teeth. Right? Every death until this bomb goes off, and now you're just vaporized, gone. Incredible. And you and you are arguably the lucky one. Yes. Yeah. One of the first things that radiation does is your body immediately goes into panic mode, Mm -hmm. starts creating a bunch of white blood cells, and then doesn't anymore. Your immune system shuts down. And then it's your gastrointestinal issues uh, where you start hemorrhaging in your intestines, which is where a lot of your body's bacteria is. So if you're... If you have a lot of open wounds that aren't healing themselves and that that's typically what takes care of you in the next couple days... Uh, reproductive health, terrible. It's it's all absolutely terrible, and I don't mean to sensationalize this, but it is it is a part of the episode uh, that it, it, I, I I have to show the terrible shit to make the point that I'm trying to. Hey, make. man, as someone who was raised in America, all three of us were. Yeah. Uh, this shit, like even with someone like Zach, who has like family. Yeah. that still lives in this region of the world. Yeah. Uh, like, we just get this all fucking glazed over of, like, we totally needed to drop those two bombs, and we Ooh. did, and it was all good, and then the war was over, and everyone got, in like, 0% APR on Ford F-100 oh, trucks. it feels so obvious, but this was the only time these weapons were used. So far. So far. So far. And, and they were used on... <laughs> You know, even if even if your your bomb happened to wipe out all twenty thousand troops stationed around Hiroshima, you you're still looking at one hundred and twenty thousand civilian deaths, mm. countless injuries, uh, displaced peoples. This and and 
uh, health concerns that last generations after this happened. This is a bomb that keeps on exploding. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and I really just want to illustrate how terrible these weapons are, even though it's not the hottest take in the world. Uh, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't <laughs> this should be. be the like the it's coldest, the most lukewarm, Morse normy <laughs> fucking take in the world. Uh, we've got another one. Uh, so, of course, if you happen to find yourself minorly injured, you are essentially deputized because yeah. this thing wipes out all public services. You don't have a fire department anymore. Yeah, you, you don't have hospitals anymore. Dude, America would be so helpless if this were to have happened in like San I mean, Francisco. You don't. You don't have shit. power. <laughs> you don't have clean water. If you if you even have running water in any sort of essence, you know your wells. Hiroshima is is kind of bisected by a river. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, it's safe to assume. Uh, a lot of deaths happen because, oh shit! I'm trying to put myself out. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I, I am, I am on fire. I'm trying to put myself out. Or it's days later, and you have people drinking from these water supplies that or are not I'm, only polluted with radiation, but also bodies and everything. Attempting else. to soothe their horribly burned bodies. Yeah, some people don't look injured whatsoever, but then a week or two later, you start getting these hemorrhage spots. Your teeth start falling your out. Your teeth start falling your out. You're bleeding falling from out. your gums. You start you start crying blood. Uh, it's, it, it, you know... Uh, start shitting a lot of blood. And and hopefully... I mean, I, I don't mean to give <laughs> you going, like... Keep going, Taylor. Go off. What else happens? Bleeding from yeah, your what eyes. Else? <laughs> start puking blood. <laughs> yeah. Like, your nose starts bleeding. You bleed from like, your nails. Uh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean to give, like, a uh, Linus tech tips, like, survival tips on, <laughs> on if... How fucked are you after a nuclear blast? So you just got uh, nuked, huh? See, so yeah, hey, buddy, you just got nuked. Um, if you're shitting yourself and throwing up, things uh, almost, you know, within hours of a nuclear blast, you probably aren't going to make it for a few weeks. Tops. Like, because uh, that's, that's a surefire sign of uh, all your mucous membranes from... From snoot to toot, <laughs> you've been exposed to so much. Are, are, are gone. It's uh, it's like a runaway engine. Yeah, like it's it, it you know it's throttled till it fucking blows up. But again, much like uh, the lady who we could see the dress patterned on, we could see that this guy was somewhat by a window, and and uh, while he may have uh, radiation poisoning. Uh, we see the burns are very much affected by just the cloth of his hat. Yeah. Wow. Protects protects uh, the top part of his head from third degree burns. So um, when your mom always told you to go out with like a coat and a hat, that coat and a hat could save you from potential injury in a nuclear blast. I just fucking that's hope so I'm weird. wearing my coat and my hat and I'm right in the goddamn epicenter. <laughs> like, that's what I've, I, my philosophy has always been for any uh, apocalyptic event. Like, please just give me the fucking I, I hope the asteroid falls on top of me. <laughs> I hope I, yeah, I hope I'm in the path of the asteroid. I hope I'm in the epicenter of the explosion. I hope I die of the virus. Like, I do not want to live after the apocalyptic <laughs> You don't event. want to live T minus 40 days after I the apocalypse. I do not want to exist a minute after <laughs> the fucking apocalypse occurs. I'm trying my best to find some silver linings in this story. And we, we are still in Hiroshima in this. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Terafumi Sasaki here uh, happens to find himself being the least injured medical professional at the Red Cross Hospital in Hiroshima, which happens to be the least damaged hospital in the Hiroshima area. Uh, so, of course, this place is swamped. Uh, this guy's he's living deb- Grey's Anatomy, dude. He's just, he's swamped. He's, uh, he's crushing he's, it. He's trying his best uh, to get other doctors back up on their feet so they can help people because there's an endless stream of people with injuries, you know, things as simple as, as you know, cuts from glass to... Yes. Anecdote. You're, you're, hey, my teeth and hair are, and blood is falling out. Yes, Short yes. story, my grandmother, who we know is Japanese, I may have told you guys this before. Your Obachan? My, yeah. my Obachan. My Obachan. Uh, yeah. She was, a, she was a cleaner at a hotel, and on the day of the bomb, they were carting people into the hotel. She had to like service people at the hotel outside of Hiroshima when the bomb was going off. That's the only story I heard her talk about Japan. Wait, shit! I didn't know your yeah, old I didn't, uh, was that close to the. Action. No, I didn't either. I didn't know she was that old. She, I didn't. Yeah, she was born in nineteen eleven. 
or damn. 1919. God damn it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, have an, I had an old Obachan. Um, but yeah, so she was just like, yeah. I did, she wasn't even, I don't remember her saying that she was close, but she was just close enough that people were still being directed into hotels to, so she to be been taken care of. In her 30s. Well, she, in her, in 30s, her early 30s. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like our age. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is fucking wild to yeah. think about. Mm-hmm. Uh, this picture on the left, this is from the rooftop of the Red Cross Hospital that uh, Sasaki worked at. As you can tell, everything around it is fucking gone. Done. Yeah, and he's, yeah. he's, he's miles from the The way em- he uh, sets epicenter. these two photos up, it looks like he... The work that this man does, especially in the days and weeks following, uh, basically writes the book on what radiation sickness is. Yeah. Uh, for, for the world. Uh, he, he, you know, it, many other experts pop up in time, but he's basically writing the day to day, you know, uh, they're shitting out yeah. blood. The teeth mm-hmm. are falling out. The hair's falling, you know, Just I, got, skin is I out. got, I got somebody who didn't look injured, but, but they are dying from the inside out sort of a deal. Uh, I mean, the, the absolute have, hero of this story. People have died of rat exposure prior to this, but this is the first time where, Human beings were connecting the fucking yeah. dots of like, yeah. oh, this causes this to happen. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm looking for any sil- like silver linings on this, and 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 it's it's people like Terafumi that really, I don't know, it, trying to find some ray of hope in this sea of absolute horror that we found ourselves in in this slideshow. Um, but next slide, please. So, the bombing of Nagasaki, only three days later, does not go quite as planned as Hiroshima. Uh, First off, uh, hours before the bombs even dropped, Russia declares war on Japan. They join the fight in an effort to, like, yes, this will force the surrender. This, yeah, this will force the surrender. Uh, and mind you, Were there Russia's no been built- Russian, Japanese? They, they never declared war against Japan, so it was only the U.S. fighting Japan? Uh, At this point in the war, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I believe oh, U.S. And, and British forces because of uh, British interests, your Australia, stuff like that. I'm sure there was a, a handful of French dudes there. Yeah, Could as you well imagine, as, as, though, like, that kind of theater, the Ruskies versus the Japanese in war? Like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, no, we'll get there. Put a pin in that. <laughs> OK, put all we already we are. We already talked about that. But, you know, put a pin in Say, that. We, we've discussed the Russo Japanese war before. Yeah. Oh, that's right. We'll, we have. Yeah. And soon we'll discuss the second Russo Japanese war that only lasts about three weeks. But also, if you're a dumb cracker, a white guy like me, like I had to be I was in my 30s by the time I realized like how fucking close Russia and Japan are to each other. Oh, oh absolutely. Really? Uh, and we'll get we'll get to a more world map image so so you guys can really easily visualize how close those are to one another. But basically, uh, the main cabinet, uh, your your war cabinet, including your emperor, uh, your your Tojo, who's mm-hmm. essentially your your defense minister, you know, your minister of war, all all these other people are. Uh, but there are there are basically <laughs> six people who are voting, in essence, of do we surrender now? And even when Russia declares war and sends about 2 million troops over the border into Manchuria, uh, even then, it's still split 3-3, three to three, whether or not Japan surrenders at that moment. While they're having that meeting, though, a bomb, is, uh, the second nuclear bomb is dropped <laughs> you know, on Nagasaki. You know the people voting are like, so what would it take for you guys to surrender? Like another bomb going off? Does another then, bomb need Mr. to happen? Mr. President! Mr. President! Uh... <laughs> Mind you, Zach, there was already an agreement on the table to surrender. This isn't like their initial decision to surrender. This is like a discussion of six powerful men to accept the American terms of like, you know, you get no cognitions. You are our, you become what they inevitably become, our unsinkable aircraft carrier in the Middle East. So we need to talk about Kakura. Kakura is is on this map. It's it's kind of located centrally between Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and Kakura is selected as the second site for the second atomic bomb. Oh, uh, your plane boxcar flies out on August 9th. Uh, yes, but to get back into things, Kakura is essentially saved by bad weather because there is enough cloud there was coverage a over storm. the. There was a little storm that day. There's a little. Cocoa. 
there's a little storm that day that saves 100,000 people's lives, possibly more. Just because, well, we want to have some sort of visual indication of we dropped a bomb. Yeah. So, after a few laps around Kakura, they decide to choose option three, which is Nagasaki. Uh, by this point, the plane is almost running on fumes. Uh, it had enough fuel to get to Kakura and back, but to do a couple laps, stop somewhere else. They know that they're going to have to stop in Okinawa, which had just been captured by U.S. forces, to sort of refuel that plane and get it back. Again, Nagasaki is sort of the the forgotten atomic bombing, in mm -hmm. essence, because 90%, you flip through any American history book, you watch any History Channel uh, special on it, it's, it's almost treated like an afterthought. Uh, but we got to talk just oh so briefly about the second Russo-Japanese oh, I love military war. movement graphs. Look at this. I know. Uh, basically, you have two million Russian soldiers. That's just a lot of Igors. Just so many Igors and Sergeys jumping over the lines, uh, uh, occupying, uh, you know, taking over Japanese-occupied Manchuria, which is your... Your armpit between a Korea and China, essentially. It's it's part of modern day China. Not quite China yet. <laughs> We've yeah, seen not... this part of the world before in the previous episode, right? Yeah, in the previous episode, we talked about Port Arthur and mm. uh, and Russia and Japan sort of the fight Bohai back and sea. forth for that. This conflict between Russia and Japan only lasts about three weeks and lasts even after the peace proposed, you know, the, the signed peace documents uh, between the U.S. and Japan. This war still rages on for a couple weeks after that. Uh, essentially splitting Korea into the Korea we pretty much know today. This is this is where you get a best Korea from, is, is the uh, aftermath of this conflict. This is where you also get a land cruiser from. Yeah. Uh, but... It, without this conflict, Japan would not be developing an all-terrain vehicle for the American military to use in Korea. Nope. Uh, all history is precedent, it's, Taylor. Isn't it's it, isn't so it wonderful? It's so crazy everything kind of ties together with this show, except Absolutely. how are we going to talk about baseball? Understandably, I mean, that you, you do see some fear and concern, but a lot of smiling faces from these uh, Manchurian peoples because they've, they've been under Japanese occupation since almost 1910. Uh, <laughs> Russia yeah. built more than one railroad to get there. Yeah. Also, planes exist at this point. <laughs> planes exist at this point, and you did have the Trans-Siberian Railroad even back before World War One, but it's been modernized and it's been perfected. To well, the... there's more than just one, so you can actually yeah. get troops to this area. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, you aren't struggling to get a sizable force. You can, you know, on the drop of a hat and almost by surprise, throw two million men who are so many um, pots coming to boil in this episode. Mm -hmm. And I, I really don't want to spend too much time uh, planting our feet in one. Uh, we got to briefly talk okay. about the American ground invasion of Japan, which was, <laughs> which I do not know when this, uh, image was made, but it does schedule the, uh, the first leg of this around November. So we can assume three months after, uh, the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, even if the bombings were successful, we were still in the planning stages of we are going to land as many men as we can and fight our way up from southern Japan north. And then, you know, about six months later, we're going to take, you know, another big iron fist of men and throw them straight at Tokyo and try to do a pincer maneuver in that. Um, it's worth noting Immediately, because uh, Japan doesn't even consider any sort of uh, surrender or anything agreeing to American terms until about six days after Nagasaki. And in that time, uh, Truman had basically, we've got the third bomb prepped. We could drop one more. We've got more. We've got more. We've got more on the production uh, we're, line. We're good for it. We got one more coming loose. We're doing big things. Not just, we're doing oh, big not things. just one. We had one more. We, we had, claimed we had. We, we had one more. Uh, we had actually made upwards of two to three more oh, at that point. And we were flexing like, we've got an endless fucking. Oh, yeah. We've no, got a Ford what we're telling Dearborn, them is we, Michigan yeah. factory line pumping these There's motherfuckers out. Like, they're Model from. T's. 
But uh, from release declassified documents, uh, the plans were all the way up until Operation Olympic, which was supposed to happen around November of that year. Which was right before Uh, Operation Downfall, which is like... Operation that's, that's, Downfall is, is the big name of everything going on. But yeah, if you have Olympic, which happens in November, and then you have Coronet, which happens in March, uh, you there were there were proposals for one more bomb in August, three more in September, three more in October. Wow. And basically, it, you know, if if that doesn't do it, we have all of our troops, everything else ready to plan an invasion. We're just going to give a bunch of fucking American military vets radiation sickness and cancer as they invade an island that has nobody on it. You can kind of see from their movement patterns, though, it it definitely if if I had any sort of guess because the targets of those supposedly seven bombs were never revealed, you can assume Kakura's on that list. Yeah, you gotta give. You gotta, gotta try get back, again. You gotta, gotta try go again. Gotta mow that piece and, of lawn I forgot about. And and you can you could definitely assume that they were going to basically. Uh, and this is just my speculation. You think uh, they focus, would stay uh, south? Focus a lot of those bombs in the middle of this pincer area. Yeah, Kyoto was probably going to get it at some point. Uh, yeah, Kyoto. Kyoto was on the list, it and had been, it, is, it had been. A, severely firebombed at that point i think uh kyoto kyoto had been firebombed but uh when it came to deciding the initial targets uh the the rumor mill the old Mm -hmm. the old Uh conspiracy theory is one of the generals had like a honeymoon in kyoto before world war ii broke out and thought it was just so quaint that it's such a nice city couldn't couldn't stand to think of that like place that he had done his honeymoon uh getting vaporized let me tell you but they got the greatest drinks it's called sake okay it's a, it's a rice grain and uh he's drinking and it. it's good stuff i had a great time on the honeymoon we can't oh it's just so way. nice the sunsets are so nice uh on the other side of that the other conspiracy theory you know to make america seem like the good guys they go oh the cultural significance of a kyoto it being the old capital yeah. yeah and all that we we can't touch that with one of our new nuclear bombs we're the good we're the good army the most moral army on earth and and you know that's all bullshit as well they would have they if any city had any sort of industry or you know every section of industry or military military civilian significance was a potential target on this uh and this and had not japan surrendered uh through radio broadcasts uh on the 15th of august yeah, which the- it was very vague radio broadcasts which ended up causing uh, a lot of your stories of people who uh continued fighting until like the 70s because it's just like oh the, the way they were they're wording it in code they japan didn't really surrender well, yeah, and it's also the the first time a many, 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 like the vast majority of Japanese people had ever heard the voice of the emperor. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So it's like, oh, just some guy came over the radio and mm-hmm. told us it's over. This is clearly a fucking psyop, mm-hmm. just like Taylor Swift in the Super Bowl. Of course, of <laughs> course. Uh, even before Who's the flying fifth... from Tokyo to get there. <gasps> Holy shit. Holy shit. Uh, Where's the fucking yarn, boys? Tojo Swift coming into oh Las Vegas. God. Uh, but there are also, uh, important to note, many different military coups somewhat happened between the 9th and the 15th. And even after until uh, the official, you know, hey, we surrender documents are signed in front of a General MacArthur on the 2nd of September. Uh, so you have this period of time where you have different military coups basically trying to dethrone the power structure of Japan itself. Yeah. Take uh, over the government so you can surrender and end it. Uh, or take over the government because... So you don't want to so surrender. So you don't want to yeah. surrender. But I assume there's still coups in both camps. America was full fucking steam ahead. Yeah, we were just going to keep dropping them. And we're we're going to keep dropping them, and then, we're, and then we're going to drop men. You know, either you've And all... then we're going to start blowing up Pyongyang yeah. after that. Pyaw! We're gonna we're gonna go to Seoul. Pyaw! Then we're gonna go to Pyongyang. Pyaw! And then somehow somehow we're also gonna take Shanghai because why not? It's just there. It's just there. It's just a hop, just a hop, skip, and a jump away. Guys, we're basically, uh, they air. also have these funny ideas about workers' rights that we should probably tamper down. Uh, but yeah, uh, I I they I do like that they call it X Day which would have been, you know, a, a your D day sort of landing, but you are, you do see some X minus twos and X minus fours, which means 
those poor fucks mm. those poor fucks that have to do the initial landing like mm. four days before everybody else shows up and you just you're just sitting here on on good old shikoku which is just a mountainous not very populated uh one of the one of the four main islands of japan but you're the gonna smallest get your shins and least blown populous. off like your yeah. cotton fucking hill <laughs> yeah uh absolute horror show that was avoided for for both both parties in this war even your third party russia which would have definitely attempted to stage something like this at the same time there the kgb also wanted to turn japan into an asset oh yeah if if, if uh just like the osi the, K, the kgb russian government was so surprised that u.s agreed to their terms to basically split korea at the 38th <laughs> parallel like they did, they, they expected America to be like, no way, and then it's just like, well, okay, like, well, we're just, I guess we're fighting Americans too now at the end of this conflict. Like, uh, the deal was too a, sweet. A a shit storm could have gotten a lot worse. Shareholder value demands that we keep pushing further into Asia after but, this point in time. But this is like the woulda, coulda, shoulda line of thought, where where you know I'm I'm really trying to stick to the history we know and not try to get into the the what ifs too much, because the reality of the situation is fucking terrifying to me enough. So, Japan surrenders. <laughs> uh, you have your. You have your broadcasts uh, on the 15th of August. You have your on your right. These are the documents being signed in front of a General MacArthur on the second. Uh, in that's between that MacArthur time, MacArthur on the left. Uh, yeah, that's that's MacArthur here. I think mm. he has his, his uh, you know stereotypical corn, corn cob, cob pipe. pipe, but it's kind of it's kind of hard to tell. He might he might be holding it in one of his. That's hands what all the hubbub is all about. That guy. MacArthur and the U.S. government have somewhat of a tumultuous. You know, he's he's kind of like a poster boy at this point in time. Uh, but all that changes once you get into your Korean War and, and he's sort of in control of the U.S. forces in Korea at the time because he wanted to essentially just, well, we got all these nukes lying around. Let's just glass Manchuria and basically <laughs> create a no man's land between Korea and China. Uh, he wanted so, to burn it all down. So there's basically burnt borders, uh, radiation borders. Uh, a man who, if if he did not get fired, would probably turn into one of the the villains of history, uh, even viewed so from uh, the American point of view. But again, this is all woulda, coulda, you know, what if history. Um, the photo on the left is a photo that I'd never seen before. This is the first American flag raised on uh, mainland Japan. Wow. And, and it's not as glamorous. Before Iwo Jima? After Iwo Jima. Okay. okay. Iwo Jima's uh, not mainland. mainland. We all, Sorry. We all, we all in our mind's eye, if we're playing Pictionary, like, we all can draw the Iwo Jima flag raising. Yeah. You said mainland, and I just didn't listen, so throw another no. one at Taylor's wrong call. <laughs> and it's not even over a government building. I believe it's over uh, what eventually became the NHK uh, news building in Tokyo. You know, if that was colorized, one of those red stripes would be blue. For, for our boys in blue. Uh, <laughs> they would be black, black and white with one blue stripe. With one blue stripe. That's what I'm saying. Uh, but yeah, in, in between this uh, time of the formal signing, uh, Tojo attempts suicide. Really? Uh, I I have I have censored the image of a very clear gunshot to his chest that self inflicted. Uh, he is alive. Uh, it's it's attempted suicide. Uh, he's alive and bumbling throughout this entire time. Basically, there was a, a once probably just begging anyone and everyone who's in like responsible for his medical care of like, please just fucking kill me. His because uh, the uh, he's met in his apartment with like a small American force that were basically under warrant to take Japanese leaders essentially for trial, mm. and rest, and what have you. In this, you know, hey, you announced that you're surrendering, but mm. you know the documents haven't been signed, so we don't want any funny business. The ink's, sort of ink's a deal. not dry yet, so let's go come, get come with us a little bit, buddy. But America does also allow like Japanese reporters to go on this because it's like they're they're not going to believe it if Americans say that we've arrested these people, you know. Mm. 
we they got to hear it from them. They didn't believe their god king over the radio that the world. No, the world no, no, was no. Over, America's so. scrambling. Uh, but some... but he's reported us. It's it's the saddest thing. He's mo- you know he shot himself. He missed his heart. Uh, mm. So he just has a flesh wound. Uh, he gets resuscitated by uh, U.S. medics and all that. But the entire time he's just kind of going like, "I'm sorry, it's taken me so long to die." <laughs> You guys don't like, have to uh, wait for me. Uh, <laughs> come on, you don't. You don't have to patch me up. Like, just I'm lock sorry. the door on the way out. I'll be fine in here. But, but uh, I, I, love, to- I, I'm sorry, but that middle photo is just so funny to me because it's like they propped his head up with the nice little. The, the pillow, pillow. And he's got he's got like someone's coat draped over him he looks like he's just like an old guy <laughs> i mean he's old tired and battered at this point uh tojo only lives for about three years after this he's put on trial he's hung uh Whoa, hanged actually huh. hang, hanged is the, is the correct yeah. term uh and he was hung if you know what yeah, i'm yeah, talking yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. we can't show that in a christian manga uh, there's there's a reason that uh that blur spot goes so long uh, there's an outline of some things uh but yeah uh again but moving on from this story yeah. because this story is not about world war ii this this is a story that needed a lot of road oh, sure. to get, Are we about to to get after started? World War Should II. Should I start recording now? Uh, lots of images here. Uh, on our top left, we have the uh, Hiroshima uh, Peace Memorial. There was many questions over the decades to follow. I don't think that the uh, the actual like museum and peace center was built until about the 70s. I mean, you have to kind of wait for rad levels to go down. Well, that's the thing. It being an airburst bomb, a lot of the ra- the people are affected by radiation, but uh, the actual like soil ground of itself, that radiation only has a half life of a few years. So you uh, you have reconstruction efforts in Hiroshima and Nagasaki within 1946, 47, 48. You know, and people are moving in. Uh, but, uh, with this crisis and with all these people affected by essentially the bomb that keeps going off in your body, uh, Japan comes up with a term called, uh, Hibakusha, which is essentially bomb affected people who are given sort of a, a special Mm -hmm. status of you, you know, you are, you're labeled as this for mm-hmm. better or worse, and usually it's for worse. A lot of stigma comes with it. Mm-hmm. Um, Social pariah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You you are you are ostracized. Why why marry the guy that got some sort of radiation dose? Uh, why you know we can't allow you into this job? You know. There's, I imagine, so many like different levels from like the practical of like, oh, this person may die early, so like, why get attached to them? Mm. To the like, oh, this person's sort of a walking, still live reminder of our great national shame and, of losing this war. And and you also have to keep in perspective, a, uh, we are on the like the cutting edge of people understanding how radiation affects the body as well. Yeah. So there is a uh, definite social stigmas of uh, yeah. radiation may be contagious. Yeah. yeah. People treat, they were Which treated in, like lepers. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'd include both memorials cause it just doesn't feel right to only talk about the Hiroshima side of this. Uh, the Nagasaki Memorial again is uh, pretty much at the epicenter of where the bomb was dropped. Uh, and I believe there are, it's not included in this picture, but they do have like a memorial list of names of uh, people that were affected and killed. Crazy. Uh, and just wildest shit. We also got nuclear Jesus in the set down, mm. middle center there. Uh, middle center. We'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, this is a memorial for a uh, young girl named Siako. Uh, she was uh, affected by the blast in Hiroshima, uh, dying of radiation sickness. Uh, there is the uh, folklore, if you fold a thousand paper cranes, your wish comes true. In the hospital, she manages to get about 640 before she dies. So this spot, which is only a couple, like, it's not even a quarter mile from the Hiroshima Peace Memorial. But, uh, of course, it's it's littered. It's littered with paper cranes. It's where you go. It's where, you know, your school children who are making mm. your cranes go and bring them out. It's, you the know. Fant- it's the fountain in which you put your pennies, but for yes. folded paper cranes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Spoiler alert, dear listener, I know this is the picture Ryan took. Yeah, this is the picture I took because because you've had to look at this one for the entire for time. a decade. <laughs> it's been I, I have a bunch of photos of when I was in Japan, just like hanging up in the kitchen. 
uh, taped up, really. I should take better care of these bad boys. Um, yeah, we don't know if Japan's going to be there forever. You might want to look back on. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Uh, in the bottom right, we have that man. We have Yamaguchi. This is a guy who worked for Mitsubishi at the time. He's about three miles out of the epicenter in Hiroshima when the first bomb goes off. Uh, he has some substantial injuries. Uh, some radiation burns, I believe, on his arms, but not affected enough by the radiation where he's completely down. He was oh, able enough to help others. And this poor man... This this is this is the poster child of the guy who's affected by two bombs. Bandaged, mm. not doing too hot, but still showing up to work in a different city three days later and is caught up in another bomb. Uh, out of supposedly 160 some odd survivors of both atomic bombs, he is the only one who's recognized uh, as essentially a double Hibakusha. The only one. Out of yeah. out of all those, he, he's he's the only one who is down in the medical record books as this Being, guy got treatment for both of them. And wow. even then, that that still took some time because he w- did not want to admit. No, that he was many at, people lived their life like if you had like the pattern of the fabric that you were wearing burn in your skin, you did everything you could to cover that up so you yeah. could live as normal a life as possible. This research was hard. <laughs> Oh yeah. This this research is tough and talking about it out loud is even tougher. So It's crazy. Like I've looked at that image uh of the the girl with the folded crane for yeah. a decade plus and like it, it it you know it hits me so much harder after having looked at it daily. Yeah. Uh get with the context. Like that's the first time I've ever had the context to that mm. to that photo. Uh and then to uh, on our bottom left, we have the Hiroshima Maidens. Uh, this was a program uh, by U.S. doctors to attempt to essentially on a victory tour of World War, you know, a victory tour of World when, War II. When they we're gonna, did the parade. <laughs> we're going to bring a bunch, of, a bunch of ladies from Hiroshima that have radiation burns, and we're going to give them plastic surgery in America, and we're going to parade them onto, like, late-night TV and stuff like that. Uh, the Hiroshima Maiden's whole ordeal is kind of met, met with uh, mixed success because it does put a face to what, the bombings had done to the Japanese people straight into American public. It undoes a little bit of the whitewashing a little bit. There were proposals to do it with uh, a a male version of it, but TV execs decided American audiences would think of these people as, ah, these are the Japanese soldiers. Your boys have been fighting. That's not good. You would undo all the, all of the quote unquote goodwill. The Americans had garnered. Uh, for the Japanese people, because like, oh, well, these were the guy, these were the boys killing our boys. Some of them went off to, you know, write some praise of this project, you know, because they they got to at least be a face for the horrors that happened. But at the same time, the the plastic surgery and everything else that was happening was really a way a way of masking, you know, again, further whitewashing this. Uh, this tragedy you're undoing like the horrible things that you have done Mm -hmm. and you you know rather than not doing those things you're just patting yourself on the back for like well at least we fixed up a handful of them yeah (laughs) that's american exceptionalism right there broadcasting to your country like see everything's fine nothing bad happened over there right we're the most moral army on earth we rebuild our enemies after we nuclear bomb them to fucking shit yeah um, moving on. That was a long first wish, boys. So we get into our second wish for the nuclear genie. All right. Second wish. How we feeling, everybody? Feeling pretty good. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my pretty good is heavy on the sarcasm. There. I knew it was coming with the first wish, and I still feel bad about it. Uh, our second wish for the nuclear genie is food and health, which uh, a lot of the selling the this atomic power to uh, the masses, you know, health in the sense of like we can use this to uh, cancer will become a thing of the past. Yes, we using will, nuclear radiation. We'll have new therapies. Uh, we'll have nuclear power plants that can run. You know, we'll have endless sunlight that can grow <laughs> crops. The you technology know, that we'll develop using nuclear a, energy. A tractor that never quits. <laughs> 
you know, shit like that. Uh, we got to talk about the third bomb. We got to talk about the third bomb that was completed, about ready to get shipped out to Japan. And was just like, send it back to Los Alamos. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to study this bomb. Uh, we, we've got to talk about, uh, again, some of these people who were in the Manhattan project. Oh, is that I've, a GameCube? Cert- Dude, that's the spiciest GameCube <laughs> you've ever seen. These are people unloading the, uh, plutonium core from a nuclear bomb from a car as if, as if they're about ready to have a sick ass land session. Uh, <laughs> yeah, dude, they're going to play melee. <laughs> They're all Jones and for the spiciest game of Smash you can come Their mom up with. said that they can stay up as late as they want because it's Saturday. Hey, is the clock in the big room set to 420? Uh, it's what actually set to 1205. Uh, no, it's, uh, it looks like oh. it's 353 three ish. Yeah, aspects of you look up any sort of uh, nuclear incidents or anything else. We're, we're talking about the Demon Core, uh, which is this spiciest. Spicy ball of plutonium. It's <laughs> a good looking bowling ball. It's a great. It's it's somebody put a nice like brush steel finish on this bad the fucking boy. Fucking ultimate bowling ball. And again, uh, the final down, bowling ball. It, it, yeah, it knocks down <laughs> all of the pins. Uh, Even if you put it in the gutter. And again, you can see uh, a lot of these experiments are done in sort of a Chicago pile sort of way, where you're having graphite and other. Uh, metals, sort of something so super dense to keep the keep those particles away from your body. In in theory, or you know, hey, we're gonna open up like a little like channel for these particles to go through. Study how those neutrons react. Yada yada yada. Uh, mad gotta look, gotta let these shit. ghosts and demons out of the out of the spicy rock. The spicy rock demons gotta gotta funnel them in a certain way. Uh, Harry Daglin. Uh, Daglian? I, I've never heard it pronounced, unfortunately. It's Irish, probably. Uh, actually, I think he's, uh, I think his father's from Turkey, if oh. I remember reading correctly. Interesting. Uh, but he's, like, just at, like, I think he might even still be in grad school while all this is going on. Uh, but basically, uh, their third core, uh, which is posthumously named demon core uh they're doing experiments on it and this is the 21st of august uh daclian is doing an experiment where he's shifting around spicy blocks around the spiciest bowling ball Mm. and one of them slips and the core starts going critical like we're talking glowing blue (laughs) wasn't he a little cocky He's a little cocky, but he's not as cocky as the guy who I circled in blue a slide ago. Okay. Uh, both of these guys have a little bit of cowboy in them. Yeah. Uh, but da- Daglian's yeah, uh, only working essentially with one other person on this, but he drops a spicy block, causes this thing to go critical, and essentially, if this, it's not like it's going to explode, but you're releasing much more radiation than anybody should ever have to experience in a very small room. So Daglian does what he's trained to do and what he thinks is the best idea at the time, and that is pick up spicy jump blocks. Jump out the window. <laughs> no, he doesn't jump out the window. He tries his best to pick up like one of these spicy blocks and put it back on here to try to contain that reaction. Gotcha. Yeah, you gotta you basically cover up the grenade that you just pulled the pin out of. Yeah. Uh, to the best and of hope his it's ability. Like, I hope it's like, that's the perfect apology. I'm so sorry. Let me put Spicy Rock back in its place. You don't have a lot of time left to apologize. Oh. These are these are Daglian's hands only a few days after the incident. And um, and we've, we've seen many different injuries from radiation exposure already in this uh, episode. But this, you don't, you don't need me to tell you, this isn't good. This is the raw shit, man. Uh, this is that uncut. This is, this is not good. I believe this upper right picture is uh, only a few hours after the incident, and you see his hands starting to swell. Uh, You're watching his hands evolve. Looks fleshy. In uh, real time. De-evolve, in a way. Uh, go back. It's, it's breaking down to its base It's going elements. so far forward, it's gone backward. Uh, these pictures were in color. I've decided to make a lot of these <gasps> pictures you. not in color. They uh, are. I can, oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, it's 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 about as bad as you would imagine. Uh, but yeah, uh, he's affected with uh, supposedly 
And I don't know what type of radiation, but give or take about 300 rads, which is essentially his hands got about 300 x-rays all at once. Which doesn't seem like a lot in the gra- in the grand scheme of things. But at the same time, this is what 300 unprotected x-rays on your hands. There is like there is lifetime limits to this. Like there's actually uh, one thing I know from like working in the field that I work in, uh, in the medical field, like we have, I scheduled for doctors who like couldn't do certain types of injections that are like fluoroscopically guided. So basically like what's fluoroscopical. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's made up. Ryan. Don't I can't even it's say it. Up. I can't even say it. <laughs> So basically, like, it, it's it's a way to, like, use a little bit, like, low-dose radiation. That, like, if you're the person receiving an injection or having fluoroscopy done, this is all done in, like, advanced imaging of, like, you know, uh, MRIs, CT, okay, okay. CTs, thing, PET scans, things of that nature. Um, that, like, if you're, you know, getting an MRI or something with, with this, like, you know, you, you're not getting many of these over the course of your life. So, like, you're not at much risk whatsoever. But if you're the provider who, like, you know, is giving people injections that's guided, like, fluoroscopically, like, mm. you have a lifetime limit of, like, how many of those procedures oh. you can perform while not impacting your overall health. And there's, like, monitors that these oh. providers wear that, like, inevitably when that thing goes beep, beep, like, you just don't do that anymore. You got to hang up that chapter. Yeah, that chapter. I guess I'm not doing this kind of treatment anymore. I can't do, you know, perform this. I'm just doing consults in the office now because I can't do this anymore or I'm putting, I'm now starting to put my health in jeopardy. Uh, There are more photos that are more and more terrible. Uh, Daglian basically dies over the course of about 20 days. Wow. Uh, painfully of darker parts is that those, supposed to be red is that is those it, those those are basically uh that's a layer below that's that's a, that's your uh yeah it's uh your lower levels your deeper layers of skin uh but since radiation kind of affects uh you're hemorrhaging everywhere that there's an injury and your your platelet count is down and everything else so it's uh it, it looks like uh raw pork raw beef Nice. Under underneath what looks to be a latex glove, but you realize that's uh, dead skin. Or it looks like that white stuff that forms around salami. There's a part of me that wants salami and a part of me that doesn't anymore after hearing that. Um, we also got to talk about Lewis Slotin. Uh, Fucking guns a-blazing Mackenzie. And uh, what's the date on him? His, he is May 21st, 1946. So we're... Okay. We're looking at only a handful of months after Dagland's incident. Uh, different policy is put into place to where, like, hey, if anybody's cowboying around with, like, a nuclear core, we're going to have a lot of people in the room. You know, when you have to do, like, safety training because, like, someone fucked up their finger with the deli slicer. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, like, every, so yeah, everyone yeah. has to learn about the deli slicer. Yeah, this is the guy that wasn't fucking listening <laughs> <laughs> during no, that session. Uh, Slotten is sort of the cowboy in the situation. And, and Taylor, you, I believe you know uh, this side of the story more than a Daglian. Because Daglian, much like a Nagasaki, is sort of, he's sort of, like, part of the history but never really focused on... Uh, but uh, Slotin is cowboying around. Uh, he is essentially holding spicy bowling ball okay. up here in the top <laughs> right. Okay. He's got a finger deep into that spicy ball. Uh, supposedly a safe place to put your finger while, while the ball is not going critical. But in order to hold the ball out from its outer, you know, chocolatey core <laughs> of other elements. So the spicy, the, the two, the inner spicy ball is not touching the outer spicy ball. He is using a screwdriver. His trusty screwdriver. Yeah, that man's dad. I can tell right now. This is some dad shit. Mm-hmm. He's putting a screwdriver between two highly volatile things, you know, in in an effort to keep it I, from I going. I bet critical. if we were to zoom out, he's got a cigarette in his mouth too. Oh, pro- <laughs> this is this is actually a reenactment because because once this what? once the, once this happened, the U.S. government went, okay, what? He, no one he, can he, touch this fucking spicy bowling ball anymore. What was he doing? Was he what was he was he sipping on a coke at the same time? Like we we got we got to recreate the entire fucking room and figure out like an autopsy what happened here. 
uh, because Slotten here uh, essentially uh, gets, I think, 1,100 rads, the equivalent of 1,100 uh, x-rays no. all at once compared to the 300. Did he arc it by like I think a I think screwdriver the arc- touching the the spicy rock with I don't know the if different he, spicy rock. Oh, I don't know God. if it arced. Uh, everyone in the room is exposed to essentially fatal doses of radiation. Uh, and and what surprises me is that Slotten is the one that dies nine days later. Uh, the rest of the people have health problems. Different cancers pop up, but a lot of these people live years after this incident. And the thing that surprises me the most, one of these people in the room is unidentified. <gasps> like, he had a good lawyer. Somebody had the best lawyer. I mean, because so everyone in that room... His name is redacted from history books. Everyone knows when Slotten utters, oh, fuck, <laughs> that they're, everyone in that room is a walking dead man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that again... So, in... I don't... I, okay, hang guys... With these okay. two incidents we've already discussed, people were just, I know we don't know anything about radiation, and we're, this is how we learn, but they were just raw dogging the bomb, just like going right on up to it, putting your fucking finger on it, keep trying to pry it open, like, oh God, they went in there wrong, I gotta pry it out of here. I mean, I mean, they aren't, they aren't doing fucking redneck shit where they're trying to pry it open. They know what they're dealing with. These right, are just are scientists. What, are, what are considered safe tests. And, and and it's I, and it's relatively safe test where it takes very little. You're you're sitting on a razor thin edge where very little can turn this from a safe test to. To my understanding, my hands look like salami now. <laughs> to, to my understanding, though, Slotten did have a reputation of like this guy kind of fucks around a lot. Oh, bit. he supposedly was wearing cowboy boots at the time yeah. that all this happened. Like he's yeah. he's he's a hey. showboat. Mm, yeehaw. He you know when you fuck around. Sometimes you find out, and you find some, out in the worst say. of ways. Uh, bop, bop, bop. And five other guys. Just but, like, so, you know. like, they had been working near this, but there was this one incident that caused them that... that oh, yeah, it, there, were mo- there were multiple tests even, even after, you know, it was, it, it was the reputation of, like, ah, oh, this is the one that killed old Harry. We really liked his jokes, you know, sort of a deal. But there were still tests being performed on this, as well as advancements in weaponry and other ways that we can use uh, this nuclear energy. Um, or how we can make it into an even more effective bomb, in case we want to keep going to Pyongyang. Yeah, why not? Why or not? Or Moscow or St. Petersburg. Or... Um, <coughs> unlike uh, Daglian, very few photos exist of Slotten within this nine days uh, before he dies. Uh, this this is one of the ones that we can find. Uh, there are a few articles of people who can find uh, these photos publicly at like a New York Library record mm-hmm. sort of uh, thing. And, uh, and this is one of the ones that they have posted. Uh, as you can see, uh, his hands are starting to get these black spots of hemorrhaging, much like we saw in the face of somebody earlier mm-hmm. in this episode. But they say the most haunting part of all is you go from, like, these pictures to, like, oh, it's it's full naked body as they're inspecting, like, you know, the radiation damage to Slotten. And then it's just pictures of his organs after he's dead. There's not a whole lot left of the man after he's exposed to that much radiation all at once. Uh, but again, I know I brought it up earlier in my little, like, hey... How you survive a nuclear attack. Yeah. But, but again, I do love these old little like scare tactics ads of like, well, you got to use, you got to use flow bar. Special <laughs> soap the, with special soap oils. To get that radiation off your body. Get that rig. Be prepared. Protect your family with flow bar. Uh, but these were products that were sold after and, and essentially, you know, there's nothing you can do if you're, you know, only have a screwdriver between two spicy very spicy rocks, but I like how they say it's a device, but it just looks like a bar of soap. I think it's a bar of soap in a plastic carrying case. Oh, that's so the soap. That so the soap itself doesn't get. Ah, <laughs> uh, you don't want it to lose its efficacy. <laughs> new, newfangled plastic materials. Uh, You're gonna love it. But yeah, uh, Demon Core is one of those stories that you can search it up on YouTube and find 
tons of things that spend, you know, 15 minutes to two hours talking about it. It's not the story that's the focus of things today, but it is part of the grander narrative I'm trying to tell. Okay. And, and I always view it as so interesting because, uh, for the longest time, the American story were like, well, the atomic bomb keeps on killing and it finally got two of our boys. And it's like, yeah, they're really like the, the 25th and 26th Americans to be killed by atomic bombs. Were there no POWs in Nagasaki? Uh, it was just there's, the, the records are a little bit shaky on Nagasaki. Uh, mm. There's like 7 to 12, supposedly, is what I've read in Nagasaki. And a definite 12 in uh, okay. Hiroshima. Uh, but yeah, uh, moving right along, it's not long before the Ruskies get the bomb. Well, they got well, They're smart. Too. They're smart people. Uh, Russia attempts its first bomb. Uh, we nickname it Joe One, uh-huh. which I think I just, uh, oh, I don't know. It needs a name. We'll call it Joe. Why not Ivan One or uh, Igor One? I don't know. Maybe, maybe there was a Joe that was really hated oh, in Joseph the office. Oh, Joseph Stalin. Oh, I never thought of that smart. Yeah. No, that, that, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. You get the gold uh, star today, Taylor. Thank you. Uh, this, of course, uh, well, this happens in 1949, so we're looking at only about three and a half years after we dropped the bomb on Japan. Yeah, people didn't stop figure trying. Like, it's not like the world's like, ah, okay, it happened. Let's stop trying to develop these. Well, even after we dropped the bombs on Japan, there's uh, probably nothing had... to this nuclear power thing whatsoever. Probably give we up did on it. That. We succeeded. Let's let's give <laughs> up. Uh, but you have a lot of your your Oppenheimers, you have your Fermis, everyone else kind of coming out of the woodwork after we've dropped the bomb and kind of been like, okay, let's pump the brakes on this research. Let's, you know, let's pump the brakes on this bomb. You know, and they're ostracized by both scientific community and the U.S. government. Because oh, yeah, McCarthyism's in full effect. Now. Oh, absolutely. They made, they, Christopher Nolan made an entire movie about it. Red Scare has <laughs> fully taken hold. Oh, yeah. Uh, but really, the uh, Russian uh, nuclear program coming to this culmination uh, is what really lights a fire under a lot of these people's asses because they kind of go like, okay, somebody else has the bomb now. A second, a player two has entered the game. Player two yeah. has entered the game. We really need to pull back and not do so many nuclear tests. We need to not develop this weapon. We need to work for <laughs> You're like... You're scaring everybody. We need to the, stop. <laughs> the, the cat's already out of the bag. You know, let's try to put it back in the bag. Uh, I know, I know there's a quote from Truman and I'm going to misquote it, but he's asked when the Russians will get the bomb after, you know, Japan surrenders. And he goes like, Oh, I'll tell you never. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to, we're going to bomb the shit out of those (laughs) Ruskies. They're never going to get the bomb. I think Uh, you did a great job. That sounds like Truman. uh, (laughs) God damn it. If Dewey could have defeated him. (laughs) I mean, he called Oppenheimer a fucking cretin. Mm-hmm. He's like, never let that cretin back in my office again. Yep, that kind of weepiness makes me sick, mm-hmm. pansy ass. That fucking <laughs> dumb commie pussy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even then, uh, all perspective, uh, espionage, everything else for how far along the Russian nuclear program was, nobody expected it in '49. They they were they were anticipating it sometime in the mid fifties, and it while not the focus of this episode, it is always astounding to me how vol. I mean, we we think of Cold War era politics when you have a player two entering the game and eventually a player three, four, five. You know, um, but how volatile the world is when only one person has these weapons. Yeah, it was a short lived and- time, but it. It's it's it's, it's a it's some of like you know again what if history but those three and a half years like no matter what America did I mean who could answer to that uh, absolutely but instead things kind of go the way they go um, we got to talk about uh, nuclear weapon development. Because there are two big schools of thought that kind of go into, well, once we had a proof of concept and once we were able to drop it on civilians, we kind of went, okay, we can create bigger bombs that do more damage. We can use other elements. We could use other elements. We could try to, why not? We'll we'll wrap it in copper. Maybe copper will affect it differently and boost the explosion. 
But then there's also the miniaturization, which happens with any technology. Okay, now we can fit four smaller bombs in some sort of, you know, this new missile technology that's coming out that'll eventually put a person around the Earth uh, on both, you know, from the Soviets and Americans. Uh, this person in the upper left is dropping... Uh, paratrooping uh, out of a out of a plane uh, with a nuclear weapon strapped between their legs. That he's is doctor, incredible. He's Doctor Strange loving it. Uh, yeah. Uh, this this bomb, of course, will not detonate with the person attached. But uh, with this miniaturization of of nuclear arsenal, uh, we were trying out things like landmines, sea mines, things like that. Uh, I believe he is dropping with. Uh, some ammo for the nuclear artillery underneath, which is a fairly safe concept because this cannon, I believe, can shoot about 20 miles and shoot something that's about half the kiloton range of, like, the Trinity test, little boy, all that. Um, so, you know, you're more tactical nuclear weapons. Yeah, I remember, like, some of the, not necessarily sci-fi, but, like, there was, you know, like, oh, inevitably there could be the suitcase bomb. That's yes. That's where you get, like, your, Dan- like, Tom Clancy, some of our fears. Yes. Shit from. Uh, and we also, because I love them rockets. Uh, <laughs> Rocket we got the, Some ICBMs. We got some ICBMs. Uh, we got the Atlas rocket here on the right, which is an American one. This is eventually what puts John Glenn, the first American, into orbit. Uh, you just swap out the warhead with a with a little capsule with that a, a man can be in. Okay. Uh, because with a, with a with a very small goon cave for one dude to float <laughs> around in, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and then uh, I believe the Russian version of that is the RZ seven. Uh, this is I don't believe the exact model of one of their early ones, but this is eventually what launches up a Sputnik. It's got uh, a great with, ass, just a great Al Pacino. <laughs> it's just got some sexy lines. It's it's. They they and they still launch basically the souped up modern version of this. They didn't, you know, they didn't remake the wheel. They just took this and then put more powerful rockets on it, and it still gets Russians into space with yeah. their Soyuz program. They got they got you know not as good of Nazis as we got, so they got yeah. you know no yeah. they didn't get as good of rockets. <sighs> Atlas they got rockets a lower pick of the Nazi draft. Uh, next up, we've got our Davy Crockett. We know it. We love it. Oh. This is a, this is essentially a bazooka that shoots a a tiny nuclear device. But so is that bazooka I mean, Joe, you can get one of these at Boom City uh, <laughs> if you know if you know the right stand to go to. Um, but even then, I mean, it's it's it it's not really ever considered for the field because it's such a small ordinance. But at the same time, somebody could effectively make the dirty bomb version of this that does a lot more damage long term. And and I just always I Gotta could you imagine could you could you imagine how like the Soviet Afghanistan war would be if you had a couple of these floating around on the back of Toyotas? Oh, that'd be so uh, cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, R.I.P. to a bunch of overpriced Hummers and. <laughs> that plot of land for a hundred years. He just, he just can't go into that Canyon anymore. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, never, never quite saw mass production, but it is an interesting concept of, I, again, with your suitcase bombs, this is a suitcase bomb that you can launch only a, you know, one time, one time, one time's all you really need. Only though. a couple thousand feet away, but at the same time, you know, this is where we were at. We've we've made this new <sighs> weapon, and we're trying to capitalize it on uh, any way we can. Imagine the program wasn't super popular because if you're the dude behind the wheel of that thing, you're gonna you're also a walking dead man. It's like mm. that dude fucked around with the screwdriver, mm. but you know, you're a couple rooms over. <laughs> oh yeah, no, because a- there's no way you're gonna fire that thing and then drive a willie's jeep with a top speed of 43 miles an hour uh away fast enough to not get fucked well that and you know coming under any fire when you have like ordinate you know even even if you had a a this size conventional bomb rocket on your you know you don't want to come under any fire it's, you don't want to flip the thing it's also stiff off-road suspension so like any small divot in the road is going to jostle the living shit out of everything Ooh. attached to the wheels yeah 
Uh, so, you know, you feel every bump in the road and you know that a nuclear weapon four feet behind your head mm-hmm. uh, is also being jostled around behind you. Uh, and my next one is is a favorite of mine. I've already spo- I spoiled this one for you, Taylor, like months ago, maybe years. I probably done forgot about it. We got to talk about the Genie, the Air 2 Genie, which is an air-to-air unguided nuclear missile perfect yep i remember this because <laughs> i remember is... my first comment being like unguided nuclear missile perfect perfect <laughs> uh this uh was basically strapped these are f90 uh, f89 scorpions it's in that awkward teenage years where we haven't quite figured out jets yet yeah. But we're getting there. There's no props on it. It's it's a jet. It's a jet. It's yeah. a jet, but we haven't figured out like the lines, you know, they even things that look closer to modern uh fighter jets come out within within this decade. But you know, this is the awkward teenage years of these. Uh essentially they're bomber interceptors. So you have something with a jet engine, something that can fly at really high altitude that can reach these bombers. You fire an unguided nuclear missile and you hopefully and take out a bunch of them. You hopefully know. you hit it or else you just took out fucking Cincinnati. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, on the right, we have the only test of this weapon, though these were fielded and fielded in America throughout the 60s and even in Canada up until the 80s. On Was lease. this like part of our... like? Were we running these for war games and like preparedness drills? Preparedness okay. drills, defense, and things like that. I mean, you could tell. Uh, like we didn't send one of these over to Korea or Nam. No, yeah. no, we we kept these stateside as sort of a line of defense. If Russia decided to send bombers over the North Pole, okay, Ca- Canadian Air Force has a bunch of these strapped to their jets all the way up till the eighties of just like a uh, just in case. Uh, but yeah, uh, on the right we have, the, and it was only tested and used once, which is very common for a lot of where, these things. Where was that at? Uh, this test? Uh, somewhere. Somewhere huh. in the sky. One time too many, probably. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and I don't know the yield on these, but it's it's a big enough boom to where I mean, if you got some fighters and bombers flying in formation, things aren't going to be so hot. Or if you accidentally decide to launch one of these towards the ground, things aren't going to be too great. These aren't these aren't the city destroying nukes, or, but these are still things that God can... forbid one of these like you lose one of these primitive jet engines and then you start hurtling towards fucking oh, yeah. Des Moines, Iowa. Yeah, or yeah, you're you're flying out of uh, North Dakota Air Force Base and you crash your plane upon takeoff and you uh, have three of these strapped to it. Ah uh, shit! Someone t- forgot to double check on the pre-flight checklist, and so Gordon fucking flew into Calgary <laughs> during a military preparedness drill, and now Calgary doesn't exist anymore. And just to uh, just to put things in perspective for modern day, uh, somebody found one. At, like there was a uh, person who died in Bellevue within this past week, and this was uh, one of these. Air two genie rockets were in their garage. Yeah. War, Warhead removed. What? It was just the casing of the rocket. But it oh, made he it didn't have the whole plane. He had just had the rocket. He had the rocket, but not but not the warhead yeah, yeah. part of the rocket. Uh, Man, it, what happens to old military <laughs> shit is always so surprising. Oh, it ends up in the weirdest places. Sometimes uh, it's called Afghanistan, <laughs> uh, or sometimes it's called Agigik, Alaska. <laughs> Uh, there were the village that I worked in, in my early twenties, uh, amongst a, like behind sort of the village, there was just this graveyard of Mm -hmm. old machinery, like (laughs) factory machinery, old trucks and cars and shit that like you just leave out to like rot away in the Alaskan winter. Uh, but just barely hanging on, like if you touched it, it'd probably turn into dust, but like, there was a handful of old PT boats like JFK. Oh yeah. Was commanding during world war two. Cause like they moved all that shit up to Alaska to be prepared in case the Japanese invaded there. Mm. And I know like I've heard stories of like fishermen who had spent time like stationed at Dutch Harbor, uh who like yeah you know like randomly if you're like out walking in the summertime like you could just be in like the middle of you know some beautiful field like in front of you know the only mountain on unalaska uh and you might like step and you hear like a a, a, you know a sort of a hollow thud and like you know if you dig up around that ground you might find a cache of old like m4 garands oh fun uh that were just laid there for like just in case just in case you know someone from alaska 
comes fighting. We have a patron tier that's like treasure hunting in Alaska. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. You give us thirty thousand dollars, and we'll go fuck around in Alaska, and, and may- maybe back, find out. Come back with some World War Two t- uh, equipment. Uh, but yeah, fun, quote unquote, fun nuclear arsenals here. Uh, we've got to turn the clock back a little bit to the fifties, hey, uh, early fifties. That guy with the tall fedora. Yeah, you remember mm-hmm. tall fedora and eyebrows, Mackenzie over mm-hmm, here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Teller and Ulam are the... Uh, They're a magic act in Vegas. <laughs> they are a magic <laughs> they, act in Vegas. <laughs> they did start with Tigers and then realized that gig was already taken. So no. they had to move on. They're, they're one par- of them, the one on the left, just shut up. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Teller and our old friend, Fermi, basically were the ones that came up with, hey, I know we're making a nuclear bomb, but what if that bomb was essentially the fuse for a bigger bomb? This idea becomes realized once Ulam joins the... Uh, you know, sort of the idea pool, you know, the brain they're trust. Throwing, yeah. They're throwing spaghetti at the wall. Uh, and, and so we have to talk about what is thermonuclear bomb, which we've already gone over all the basics. You got You, you got a nuclear bomb mm. and then you got a little channel that takes all that spicy energy that you're exploding from that nuclear bomb. And you just throw a bunch of other elements underneath that. Yeah, you got an ac delco spark plug that you just pulled out of your chevy suburban mm-hmm. yeah yep, yep. down at the bottom you, you got, got a some polystyrene styrofoam. foam yeah mm. you got some styrofoam cups you got your ac delco spark plug uh, i see a honeycomb uh, and some fiberglass or whatever you got a secondary uh, device you know like you need you have your primary device so you need a secondary uh-huh. yeah uh but i mean you know it's it got a catalytic converter uh that's the honeycomb <laughs> fiberboard support and uh, then you got your Jimmy Neutron reflector. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You know this. I know how to make it's a bomb. Shit. You know. It's basic shit. Uh, but yeah, uh, these somewhat spearhead the idea of, uh, even though it is kind of a faux pas, making bigger bombs because... It shouldn't be escalating this. Well, anything larger than a, you know, little boy, fat man kind of bomb is kind of viewed as a device purely for genocide. What do you drop this on? You you can only drop it on a population center, you know, in, in theory. Unless we get really pissed off at like a pod of whales. And or we or the moon. We launch them. them at the moon. Or what about clear cutting? Couldn't you do it for like if you just needed to? You didn't want to use the resource of trees at all. <laughs> Fuck you this one. You the trees. <laughs> If you decide, hey, you know, <laughs> the railroad needs to go through this mountain and we want to get rid of it quick. I mean, there nuclear. are things like there are there are things like that where there were there were under uh, underground nuclear devices and all that were in theory. Hey, can we use these to mine? You know, other practical non wartime uses for this that all kind of got poo pooed for obvious reasons because you irradiate the shit out of shit and it's fairly unpredictable. You could again, you could have two nuclear devices that are identical but react very differently with just minor differences in soil composition and everything else. Um, but yeah, uh, we, we talked about the smaller devices, so we might as well talk about some of the larger ones. Whoa. Uh, so uh, on her bottom center here, we have Operation Crossroads, and I can't quite remember the name of this bomb. If It's, uh, it's uh, called the Cody Rhodes. It's called the yeah. Cody Rhodes. Uh, the American Nightmare. <laughs> it, was, it was nicknamed. Uh, this was a test, and it's so it's so hard to see, even if the photo was blown up to massive size. But we have a bunch of Japanese and American and German ships uh, that we are basically these are going to be scrapped anyway. Mm. But uh-huh. we want to see. We want to know. Hey, what happens if you have a big nuclear sea mine? What does it do? What does it do to these boats? We really would like to make a Godzilla. Well, well what, what happens? What happens here? Uh, not good for the boats, obviously. You, oh, you know. oh, the boats don't love it. It doesn't feel really good for no, the boats. No, it does not feel really good for the boats. A lot, a lot of like, some of these boats, even farther away, are so destroyed and damaged by uh, a nuclear explosion that they're just kind of like, oh, well, there's nothing we can do. We can't make armor that helps with a nuclear explosion. Oh, we like, can't make a nuke-proof boat? We can't make a nuke-proof boat. If, if it's detonated under the water or over the water, you're losing half of the boat, basically, above the waterline. Uh, 
And a lot of these tests are done in the South Pacific, uh, much around like the Bikini Atoll and yeah. other Marshall Islands. That's why we also were, we thought we were creating Godzillas, but instead we were creating Spongebobs. We were creating Spongebobs. <laughs> yeah. I like this top center because you get, uh, you, you see where they detonated one of these sons of bitches. Uh, and it, it yeah, just... Yeah, that coral reef is fucked. And this is only a about i think a quarter mile wide but yeah that coral reef is absolutely fucked you you know you have weapons at this point that can change the landscape of wherever they're used uh a lot of these tests of course as with every bomb being kind of different and trying different things a hey, let's why not let's let's throw some beryllium in this bomb or something like that you're creating tons of nuclear waste uh, so what they end up doing, and there's only I one of these that I know. Uh, the world's biggest nuclear landmine. Uh, no, this is this is just a. They, they just dumped a bunch of nuclear waste in the middle, like into a crater, and then concreted it over. Mm. And Hanford, you can, what, Washington. What is approach. nuclear waste? Is it just like the exposed land? A, a ra- yeah, irradiated land. Uh, any soil soil gotcha. heavy water byproducts anything like that anything that you could salvage and pick up you know you know they're they're, they're dredging up the sea floor on these craters when it and comes to putting putting explosions it in the hole. like nuclear waste from energy production is like spent uranium rods and wastewater mm. you can uh still visit the runet dome it pops up on google maps sometimes <laughs> why would you <laughs> uh i don't know but there are people walking on it in this image and this is That's this is like cool this is like fresh after I mean, it's yeah, been poured. It's a dope ass picture, but like you know, I see it brought up a lot when people are like alien existence. You yeah. know, your YouTube shorts. Uh, my mind's, like, well, my mind's well, racing I found right a now UFO in the Marshall Islands. How to make a conspiracy with this? Like I'm, I'm, I'm thinking just, like, oh, fuck, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make some false information about this image. I'm just thinking of like there's going to be some sort of late night commercial like were you or a loved one walking across the irradiated <laughs> UFO out on that island somewhere you may be entitled to compensation. Uh and I wanted to include more pictures of the dome because it is kind of uncanny only about like 300 feet uh down from this picture is another crater almost the exact same size from a different nuclear bomb and it's just like well they're planning ahead, but they never use that one. Well, for the like... first bomb already dug the hole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we got to talk about this guy on the right. Uh, this is a smaller yield. Um, Where they put some mentosium and some Diet Cokeium. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> even even, <laughs> that's, even this that's guy. <laughs> that's pretty good. Thank that's you. pretty good. Uh this bottom guy, uh, bottom center with the boats, even though it's large and impressive, this is still a simple fission bomb. We haven't gotten into your Teller Ulam device where it's a thermonuclear weapon. Uh, this is the first test of one of those. They called it George. It's a very small yield. Uh, but again, we're reaching the point where even small yields are completely blowing apart the, uh, the atoll it's basically sitting on. Yeah, it's becoming way more efficient. But it is a very aesthetic bomb. Like mm-hmm. when I think of mushroom cloud, I've I've always imagined this where it's like it's it's got a little bit of a butt to him. This this bomb has curves. <laughs> this mushroom cloud is having violent diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> it's blasting off. Yeah. This is me after a deep dish pizza. <laughs> it's it's got like a sideshow bob feel to it. Yeah. But uh, this is not the bomb we are talking about and the focus of our story today. Uh, we are talking about a test that involves a device called the shrimp. The shrimp. I wondered if there, the shrimp was going to come back into play in this whole thing. There's a whole reason why I named this episode Progeny of the Shrimp. And this is the shrimp. Uh, as you can tell, it's about 15 feet long, about three, four feet high, uh, surrounded by danger, no smoking signs, which of course, should be because it's... Because it's a fucking. Because you don't want to get cancer. <laughs> you don't want to get. You, you don't want lung cancer. Uh, but also, you know, you're you're dealing with some volatile explosives on top of spicy rock. So you know, it's better better be safe and not smoke. Uh, you also got your Oso Classic, some shirtless dudes standing around the thing while it's loaded on a trailer. Oh yeah. Um, the shrimp is a special case. Uh, it's not, of course, the first thermonuclear weapon tested. 
but it is sort of in that second, third wave of batch of these where we're really trying to push things far. Uh, what we get out of this is the Castle Bravo test. I like that. And the Castle Bravo. Wow. What a fucking name. That's cool. Uh, the Castle Bravo test was supposed to have a yield of five megatons, which is thousands of times. I mean, again, energy goes exponential on these, but it's thousands of times more powerful than your Trinity, than your Trinity, than your fat man, little boy. Um, this thing goes off. It's supposed to be five megatons and ends up being 15. Whoopsie. This is a whoopsie. This is, this is. This is the right time. This is a test, so it's 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 the quote unquote right time to have an oopsie. But this is a your bomb exceeds greatly. What I mean, you less than it. ten years ago, we were like, oh, if we do one of these, we'll destroy the world, and now we're just like, oh shit, we made one three times more powerful than we thought we would. Put a little uh, too much sugar in that one. This crater is about a mile and a half wide. Someone must have been Yo. smoking around this one. A uh, mile about- and a half. A mile and a half, about 600 feet deep. Uh, it's hard to imagine around uh, an atoll, but we do have nuke maps to help us out with the extent of the damage that something like this would cause. And we're looking at something like this. Ah, fuck. Bremerton's gone. You have everything for, for your Washington resident. Dear, dear you have- listener, if you or viewer, uh, <laughs> that is the same exact spot, but the, the map is so much farther zoomed out. You have everything from the Everett Mall to the Tacoma Dome fucked. Oh, cool. I'm good. My, apart- my apartment's only a mile or two north of that. I, I mean, everything around that is also fucked to yeah. a lesser degree. But just the scale of this thing, this the, the fireball of this thing is larger than the whole dimensions of damage done at a Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I am in awe at how big this is. It is hard to gauge the scale on this. And this is the largest test that America did on a nuclear weapon. This is it. This, this, is, this is our high watermark for America. Uh, right. This happens to be the sixth largest test ever done in the world. Uh, feel free to go on your We're nuke map. We're sixth on the list? What the? F- We're not back-to-back World War champs to be sixth on any list, y'all. There are, there are five Russian bombs that were tested that were larger than this. Uh, one of which being a 50 megaton bomb, which uh, essentially stretches this, uh, you know, this area of damage from a Bellingham all the way down to an Olympia. Oh my gosh! From one bomb, there Uno, was a there, Uno bomb. There was an eighth ocean before 1970 that we just don't talk about anymore. That got absolutely vaporized. yeah. There's like a third third of an island, you know, north of the continental Russia that that is just gone now. Uh, Holy crap. But again, with the Castle Bravo test and so many things that that can uh, unforeseen things that can go wrong with this event, we need to talk about fallout, the, the fallout and the mass of an explosion like this, because even though you're testing these in uh, in, you know, in a toll, uh, a lot of these are coral atolls. And when you have an explosion of that magnitude, you are pulverizing coral and essentially making a fine dust that spreads this radiation much further than you would ever anticipate. People don't think about being downwind or down water, huh? There's a lot of Nemos that are just now floating yeah. around glowing. And, and while the Bikini Atoll uh, over here was used for many different tests uh, and, and some other tests around uh around this area of the marshall islands you had islands with still a civilian population on them that are now being affected by this test yeah but they're not white people so we yeah, didn't yeah. really worry about it oh, of course not put a pin in that first uh, off they have zero mcdonald's i'm guessing so they yeah don't not a single mcdonald's people. on any of those islands and probably not a single mcdonald they might have had blue jeans no they didn't even have a dairy queen <laughs> uh so we get finally after so many images and so many slides, we we get the focus of our story, which is the Daigo Fukuyuru Maru, or the Lucky Dragon Number Five fishing boat. I like that. They were essentially told of a stay out of this area. We're doing nuclear tests, mm-hmm. and they did. Oh, good. 
They did. The only the only problem is is oh, so it's a great story. Story's over. Story's bad. over. No, nothing, nothing bad, bad ever happened. happened. They all went home and became salary men. <laughs> and uh, they had a great time. They they went they went to Tokyo Disneyland later. They all life. went to Tokyo Disney and then celebrated at their ninetieth birthdays at karaoke bars. Even staying out of the supposed danger zone didn't help with an explosion that that was so many more magnitudes bigger than what the test was anticipated for. So the crewmen of this fishing boat, which isn't the only fishing boat uh, that was affected by this, as well as the civilian populations of the neighboring atolls, um, basically, you know, you're out fishing, you're doing your shit for the day, you're working hard. You see and f- hardly working. And hardly yeah, working. That's what I'm talking you're, about. You're rolling some dice. You're playing some dominoes. Uh, they do not see... Th- they are far enough away to where they do not see the blast. They see, you know, something is lit up on the horizon. And then within a couple hours, it starts raining ash and dust. Very, very fine ash and dust all over their ship. Somebody, you know, sticks out their tongue, tastes it like it's snow. Oh. oh, not 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 the person who's most affected by this. Again, this you know, nuclear radiation is non-biased, but does affect everybody in a different way. Um, they start noticing something's wrong about a day or two later, when people's gums are bleeding, some people's hair's falling out. Okay, well we gotta hightail it and get back to to mainland Japan. Uh. I think they get they get stopped up for like a three or four days with like a small storm on their way. They end up having to throw out about half of their catch that they had. Uh, but by all the, these fish turned into jelly. <laughs> uh, it's it's not until the time that they get back to mainland Japan do they find out that they are severely radiated. Uh, and not only them, but but the food that they were you know the fish that they were carrying within their boat. Uh, it causes a panic and crisis uh, in Japan in 1954. Like we aren't even 10 years from the atomic bombing and it's like, it's happening all over again. You have different uh, Japanese like food administrations being like trying their best to figure out what boats were where, which boats had, which food, what food do we need mm. to get rid of? It's like Romaine every few years where they're just yeah, like, Oh fuck. The, you're going to get, you're going to get botulism. Out. Yeah. Uh, I do not know if either of these gentlemen in the pictures is, uh, da, 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 Kubo Yama was the only casualty from Lucky Dragon number five on this. Uh, he dies within a couple weeks of this incident. The rest end up with various cancers and live years, some, some living decades after this, but health problems persist. Probably, especially for the dude, the poor schmo that that tasted it like it was falling snow. Yeah, you don't want to put it in your body. No, you don't want to willfully put. I mean, it it's in already going to go in your body, but you don't want to. You don't want to hurry up that process. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to accelerate that. Um, but yeah, this this causes a complete crisis and and shakes Japan to its core because these people, you know, they were just getting over this. And now you have another radiation scare, something that's not affecting military men. It's affecting civilians. It's affecting people just trying to do their job. Out and in the I world. mean, with how distribution of like food works, then, hey, oh, this isn't just like, hey, it's the people who got bombed. It's, mm. oh, no, this could go from like Hokkaido to no, Okinawa. No, now your supermarket's a dangerous place yeah. to be because we don't know what's irradiated. And these uh, irradiated fish could be get, touching now. You're now irradiated grapes and you're irradiated rice and you're... The, the full extent, and this is only from the Castle Bravo test. I mean, there are, there are other radiation concerns that begin popping up after this, but this is the big wake up call because I'm now sure America stepped up and took responsibility for this. Oh, uh, absolutely totally had not. To. Had to. <laughs> ah, We're, they're the good guys. Absolutely not guys. Of course they didn't. What? We did the wrong thing. Uh, Japan in some ways doesn't step up. They don't give them the, uh, uh, Hibakusha status where they're, you know, radiation bomb affected mm-hmm. people. Uh, the people who are affected this, not only the, the people on lucky dragon number five, but you know, other fishing boats in the area, 
uh, there are still elderly Japanese people fighting to get some sort of compensation. Some compensation. Them and their loved this. ones may be entitled to compensation. Yeah. Mm. They got to call J.G. Uh, Wentworth. Uh, but yeah, I got some pictures of, of the crisis. Uh, wow. you have, you have people here who are using Geiger counters on tuna. Uh, these are some of the stockpiles on this left photo from the, uh, lucky dragon number five hall. Uh, and we have some whale meat that is, this is sort of just how they keep it out when it's being loaded from one ship to another. So you can imagine with the amount of goods that are being in and out, you know, it's it's hard to really gauge the extent of how this affected. Uh, but it's it's not just Japan. It's it's not just people working on Japanese fishing boats or Indonesian fishing boats or anything like that. Philippine. Philippines, people people locally in mm -hmm. the Marshall Islands. Uh, we we have to talk about the continued effects. America tries to turn this into a small silver lining, a small secret silver lining. Uh, we have Project 4.1, which is okay. a, terif a terrifying name. But essentially, and, and I, I like the wording on this, the study of response of human beings accidentally exposed to significant fallout radiation. It's, it's you know, significant. <laughs> someone who's picked a whole bouquet of nuclear whoopsie daisies. I, 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 I stewed through it. Like some of my notes are like, like, ah, we're accidentally exposed to significant amounts of sodium. <laughs> like, like, uh, it's, it's that modifier there that really, really is terrifying. <laughs> um, this was something where, periodically over the course of a decade, they would go back to uh, different people who I, I believe they're called Marshall, Marshall knees. Uh, the, the people indigenous the and Islands. people of the Marshall islands. And they would mm. go back and they'd be like, okay, cervical cancer. What's our rates at? Okay. Thyroid Through the fucking cancer. roof. Th oh, 50 times greater than the U.S. at that point. Uh, birth defects. Like, they would spike, they would drop, they would spike for no reason at all. It was just a science experiment. An accidental, significant an accident science oh, experiment. Here's our chance to, to see what radiation does in, you know, fallout, what it does to a population over a given period of time. And it's so interesting that they're all isolated on an island, too. So it's not like you can have contamination coming from other places. You just. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, I don't want to put my tin cap on or hear anything, guys, but. And, and of course, there's it wasn't an everyone's pointing fingers at everyone else. Uh, there, there are definite uh, you have people from the Marshall Islands, even up until modern day, being like, no, no, America knew the extent of what this was going to do and essentially has, has turned an entire population of non-white people into guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. uh, you have America. But that would be pointing... like the first time that's ever happened. Never once before have we ever done that. <laughs> no, never once. Never uh, once. You, have, you have America pointing the finger at Russia, saying that. Well, we told these people to stay out of like the danger zone, <laughs> but but you know they must have gotten some word. They're the Russian plants, you know, who decided to fish a little bit too close, or and it's just an entirely fuck situation that I've never heard brought up in anything, really. Like like I, I hear about the Lucky Dragon number five incident, but you don't hear too much about this this Project Four Point One, which ends up going all the way almost to nineteen seventy. And then they just stop checking in on people. They just kind of go like, yeah, we got our data. Well, were there any we people are... left, you know? Are we going to do anything? We uh, got our results back. Turned out it was too big of a bummer to keep going. Yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, I was worried about this image here in the middle with this kid with, uh, with vitiligo. Until I realized that uh, some nuclear exposure can actually cause vitil like, vitiligo. Really? Wait, that causes vitiligo. That's not like skin discoloration due to like, some exposure? some skin di discoloration okay. can happen. But if you are in early development and other things like that, you can you can onset some vitiligo from nuclear exposure, like ah, radiation exposure. Okay. I, you know, very macabre to say this, but like, you know, just like casually commenting on how you interpreted that image. 
but I, I thought this was similar to like what we saw with like the people whose like fabric patterns were burned into the skin because mm. it seems like the light spots on this child's skin are in the areas that may have not been exposed when that flash of nuclear no. e- energy is we're, released. We're out of, uh, when it comes to Castle Bravo, there's not too many people affected by the flash. This is just lingering fallout. Okay. Uh, significant fa- fallout. Si- significant fallout. Accidentally uh, so, exposed. Uh, accidentally exposed that to a significant... That is such a tedious title. Study of response of human beings. So it's the study of how the human beings are responding to accidental. They didn't intentionally get it. They weren't intentionally exposed to significant fallout radiation. They should have just called this like a study on the resiliency of the human spirit after a global empire that's very sorry <laughs> had, a so- sl- had a slight whoopsie doodle. Everybody gets one. Uh, but yeah, moving on. Uh, these on the right are some of the elderly people who have been working around the Marshall Islands and other nuclear testing sites who have been demanding compensation. Uh, I believe this photo is from about 10 years ago. So who knows how many of these OG sons and, and Obachans are still around. But yeah. uh, the fact that these old people have to go out and protest to get some sort of recognition compensation once again it took john stewart and a bunch of like people dying of cancer screaming in senators faces to get like our 9-11 first responders Mm -hmm. to have their like health care covered so yeah not surprised that like people on little islands forever away who will never crack like mainstream american media get absolutely zero attention or compensation it's kind of the rule isn't it Mm mm-hmm and on the left side, uh, we have our good old Lucky Dragon number five boat, which no kidding. Af- after they didn't encase that shit in concrete, they well, threw I it in. It, it lived. It lived in a junkyard outside of Tokyo for about forty years before, <laughs> before somebody tromping through the junkyard kind of went, oh, it, you know, they they match the markings on one boat or another. Yeah, it got the Egagic uh, Alaska treatment. I'm just like, yeah, fuck it. We'll leave it there. But uh, it was found by people in a junkyard and basically semi-restored to what it looked like when it was sailing on that day and is now uh, a, a a sense, a memorial for those that were lost and a reminder of Did they wash the it with that soap so it has less radiation on it? Oh, yeah. It? They, they took flow bar and they put that shit all over they Rubbed it, it all over? Yeah. Okay. Thank God. <laughs> uh, but yeah. But it's it's the stories we tell in the media that we consume that really shapes our perspective on a lot of different uh, aspects to personify, in a sense, this tragedy. It, it, there's an old idiom who I don't know who to ascribe it to, uh, but it's, you know, a single person that's killed is a tragedy. A thousand people killed is a statistic. What's Mr. Joseph Stalin? Oh. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> good, old, <laughs> good old Joe who killed lots of people. Uh, Ishiro Honda is one of these artists. Uh, he was a... Uh, he never had any sort of high rank in the Japanese military, but he did fight in the Maturian campaign uh, uh, near the end of World War Two. Likely a, a guy who came of age and was conscripted into the military. Yeah, I mean, he looks, he looks fairly young here in this bottom left-hand photo. Um, he makes things that we would typically call propaganda films, but, uh, these two films that were released after, uh, in fact, during the, uh, American occupation of Japan, uh, we have... That ended? That ended actually but, um, around the 60s. Nah, man, I mean, there are... That, that ended on paper around the 60s, I was say, they, but it's They're not still... just a, a bunch of mil- missile silos that we point at the China. Ri- the ripples, the ripple effect. We are still, we have military bases in Japan and everything else. And, and uh, uh, but Honda here, he makes uh, his, his movie here on the left is Escape at Dawn, which is about oh. almost a self-insert of himself as a soldier uh, fleeing from the Russian soldiers that are coming down into Manchuria. 
Uh, he makes very humanistic tales focusing not on the glorification of war in a sense, uh, because I feel like a lot of that wouldn't have been allowed by one Japanese film industry and two occupying Americans, but having sort of a generic, uh, you know, courage and love triumphs all these very generic Michael Bay ass Hollywood sort of messages in his movies allows him to get away with quite a bit. Um, his other movie is Eagle of the Pacific over here. And both of these, I believe came out in like uh 50, 51. Uh, he gets, he, he gets a big raging boner for using miniatures. Oh, nice. He's trying his best to make a Japanese movie that will appeal to American audiences who are stationed over in Japan, but also at the same time, uh, trying to find some way to make a boom, boom, big movie in essence. I love it. So he, he works with a lot of special effects uh, artists and everything else to, you know, create flying planes and miniature boats and scenes of war and everything else. But we would not know of a Shiro Honda today if it weren't for one Mr. Woo! Godzilla. There he we, is. I knew we were getting there. We finally got there. Mr. Steal Your Girl. Mr. I love this picture. This is this is a behind the scenes of uh, the first movie in 1954, which um, I, I you, you I love the Godzilla film franchise, but the original movie is just so fucking dark, bleak, and depressing. It mm-hmm. is it is essentially you know the story of personified nuclear disaster. It's art mm-hmm. therapy. It's 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 very much so art therapy. I mean, this thing shows up. Uh, it, it it burns down your town and it's it, the you original can't 19- do shit about it one you can't do shit about it Two, the military can't do shit about it and godzilla 1954 kind of has this weird uh i don't want to call it supernatural but it's the kind of thing where any of your secondary and main characters who kind of lay their eyes on this monster or are close to it die in some form or fashion throughout the movie it's 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 a multi-layered uh allegory really putting a big scaly monster face godzilla is ringu yeah he is mm. he is the radiation um uh but yeah big monster movies not completely unheard of of course at this point i mean america had a king kong and japan even had like three or four king kong movies that are even lost to time at this point uh so putting guy in suit you know stomping around a model city is nothing new but I mean, stories of big monster have like followed mankind from yeah. the caves. Yes, uh, but but the artistry and the craft in a Godzilla, uh, his his skin are, is meant to look like radiation burns. Oh wow! Yeah, and and things like that. There's there's so many little touches behind this goofy little grin. Is in he wearing 19- glasses too? Is do my is there a reflection happening in the eyes? I think there's a little bit of like a, a light spot. I don't know if that's glare on the camera lens or or if that's just a particularly shiny spot that the light's hitting on that. And uh, I like the top right image of it's like Godzilla saying, like, give me a break. We're on the 50th take. Can I please go to the dressing room and grab a Coke Zero? I need a minute. And well, the I mean, guy at the suit is just like, um, Okay, uh, well, just one more, Mr. Zilla. Mr. Zilla, can we just have one more take? I assume, I mean, this is this is Ishiro Honda here, in, in you know, on, on the left. Uh, I assume this is a person bowing out of respect, but just so happens to be in the Godzilla suit. Uh, uh-huh. I mean, yeah, uh, I, my theory was, like, you probably can't hear shit in that fucking suit, <laughs> so he's probably leaning in to, like, take eh? to get some- what'd, you, what'd you say? What'd you say, Chuck? What? What'd you say? <laughs> What do you want me to do? I please. I just want one. Like I would like to get this done in the next take, so I can go smoke. But uh, this God- asbestos costume you put me in is getting stuffy. Godzilla and uh, and Honda here go hand in hand. He ends up directing like six or seven movies. Is, all through- is Godzilla his brainchild, or is he just the guy that had got Godzilla to direct is- the? Oh, Godzilla's his brainchild. He had an idea for a movie about a radioactive octopus. And then after the Lucky Dragon number five incident, it just sort of, I don't know what gears clicked, but he went big lizard. It's, it's a big lizard. And I got my story now, you know, it's, I was going to do a radiation monster movie, but now, you know, because of this recent incident, I can almost capitalize on 
which uh, it, it it I mean, entertainment does that constantly of like, hey, there's a story in oh, the news. Like you let's... mentioned art therapy. Yeah. It's sort of like, hey, how many American movies had buildings crumbling down after 9-11? Like right. uh, how many how many big action movies now have a boom, boom, big set? I mean, piece? we got Nicolas Cage's finest film, World Trade Center. <laughs> Well, I think of even things you're, you're you're looking at ten plus years later with like your Avengers, like yeah, oh, oh we got oh it's it's a fun romp, but we still have to have danger in New York City. I mean, you have mm-hmm. movies that like go too far, and then the movies to correct them, like Batman v Superman. Oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, art art therapy. Uh, Japan uh, Godzilla is initially criticized by uh, Japanese film industry critics the, and all that because it's hit it, with too soon. Well, one, it's it's hit with a too soon and too dumb schlock. And also, it was somewhat critical of the Japanese government in that movie. Uh, we see more modern shades of that in, like, your Shin Godzilla, which comes out in yeah. 2016, which is basically mm. the first movie but remade to be about, like, the Fukushima nuclear disaster and the inept government and how they handle that. Uh, but there are shades of that in the 50s movie where you have it'll cut back to the government and they don't know what to do about this nuclear disaster going on. And eh, some people didn't like that criticism at the time. There's still a lot of nationalism. Oh, for <laughs> sure. In there's, Japan there's, at this time, there's nationalism with the side of guilt. And also mm-hmm. I, I believe in some point in the writing process, Honda wanted to really state that Godzilla was caused by American nuclear tests. And I believe that was vetoed. So it's only implied and never directly said. Interesting. Yeah, things like that. I mean, like nationalism is so fervent. There are still dudes throughout the Philippines who are still think the, the war is going on. Oh, at yes. At this point in time. At this point in time, there will be people fighting for 20 more years in the jungles of the Philippines and, and elsewhere. So what about looking- the weight of like a Godzilla being that the Japanese people who had to get so far behind their government and trust. Now the trust is betrayed. Now they're making art mediums that are in a criticism of their trust that they did put into the government and how inept that they were at sa- saving them from. It's interesting that now they get to start the commentary against their, their government. And yeah, people are going to, the nationalists are going to be hit with like, eh, I don't know about that. That's, that's kind of rude to criticize the government, but then it sparks this next generation that begins to question because they're being broadcast that kind of ideals. Whereas those ideals didn't quite exist so much in pop culture before the war. Um, and, and even then when it comes to nationalistic ideals, which, which a lot of the Godzilla movies kind of touch and go on, uh, depending on the era that they come out in Japan, mm. uh, you have a lot of movies like Honda's previous movies where it's like, it's a human tale that happens to take place during the war. And we can't really be one way or the other. We're just going to mm. show these brave men in, in terrible situations uh, but having a Godzilla opens things up to Japan having some sort of pride of they have a defense force. They have little toy tanks that try to shoot at Godzilla, and they aren't going to be that effective. But, They've but got... raw, raw, the power of Japan can can you know maybe maybe stop this this existential threat that's coming to face us. It's it's an interesting concept for what is essentially a dumb monster movie, and the series just spirals everywhere after this i mean none of the movies take themselves as seriously as the Mm -hmm. 54 one uh your godzilla eventually stops in essence becoming a symbol of nuclear destruction and kind of becomes a guardian of earth against other things be them pollution space aliens you know other monsters other monsters Mm. it just sort of it went went into the toy phase right which is kind of where i got on board and my mom would show me the old like when i was like i want to get that godzilla toy she showed me the 1950 uh something and she showed me the chronological of godzilla but it it had that arc too right like godzilla became this what it got westernized you had your godzilla with the uh that was like godzilla 2000 or whatever uh, the with 98 the, one with like a Matthew Broderick and all yeah, that. Yeah. Matthew Broderick was in it. Yeah. That one where he's like sponsored by Doritos and Pepsi, that version oh, of Godzilla. But, but you also have common themes and it's not just a radiated lizard. A lot of Godzilla movies typically start much like a lucky dragon. Number five, an incident happens on a boat. Mm. Even in your Shin Godzilla, it's, it's your professors mm-hmm. on the boat doing the research before the monster shows up. Your Matthew Broderick. It's some sort of like, 
oil tanker or whatever that they're on. Like it's always man's hubris going too far, fucking up, and now we have to. Now Godzilla is here to like bring the reckoning. Yeah, and just for funsies, I do, I do, I do have a selection of what Godzilla eventually became over all these years. You yeah, got, the world you, religion of capitalism always gets its claws into everything. <laughs> so yeah. It gets commodified. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in your upper right, you do have Godzilla fighting a monster made out of pollution and nuclear waste. So you have beautiful, essentially the script flipped in the 70s uh you've got godzilla getting busy doing a dunk on charles barkley in a comic tie-in for some nikes yep so charles did need to be taken down a peg and a you know <laughs> a nuclear monster is the one to do it uh i do i do i'm so glad i found this this big image here of of good old person in an inflatable godzilla suit at the trinity <laughs> testing site wow and and you that can see is ta- great Tall Paul back here is not having it. No. Uh, no, he supports the troops. <laughs> uh, you got something that happened in the past couple years where there was an NHK Japanese special about this. Uh, I, I don't know for certain if this is an autistic female. <laughs> I don't, we, got I an, don't, we got an MTV True Life. Like I We got a Godzilla. True Life where they gave like a 15-year-old girl the date of her dreams. She got to go on a date with Godzilla. And it was a, it's a big hour-long special that you could see. And it's very... It's, That's it's, poetic to a degree. It's very goofy, but we, it's but it's shot in, in such a way where it's just kind of like romantic dinner, but with guy in Godzilla suit, like walks on the beach, <laughs> guy with Godzilla suit. A guy with a Godzilla suit trying to cut a steak at a fancy restaurant. Guy with a Godzilla suit, like pulling a rose, <laughs> but he can only reach like like a foot behind him in the suit. Uh, trying to pull her chair out at dinner. Yeah. You you know you and what's know. what's the center? What's the center one? Uh, the center is my personal favorite Godzilla movie. Uh, Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah, giant monsters, all out attack is a title. <laughs> <laughs> Save some words for the rest of us, please. <laughs> I like to buy a uh, vowel. Uh, but it is it's a standalone movie uh it's it's very interesting in the fact that uh it has a lot of locations and references to the lucky dragon number five incident uh when godzilla finally appears on screen and your fanfare goes up he's in the same bay that they're throwing out those radioactive tuna from the lucky dragon number five incident he immediately fucks up a fishing boat uh now he's fucking up aircraft carriers uh, oh no, those are those, are, those, those are, are docks. Yeah. Uh, but also interesting in the fact that like Godzilla goes from a symbol of the terrors of of a nuclear bomb, nuclear radiation, to being sort of like Earth's antibody to pollutants and other monsters and what have you. Yes. Uh, His hero GM- arc. GMK giant monsters all out attack makes him a villain again. And he is essentially the go the, the ghosts of people that Japan fought in the war. Oh, he is essentially the ghosts of, of Filipinos, Indonesians, Chinese, oh, not those crow hopped Nebraskans. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> the what? Oh, like just the, the, the fucking waves of Nebraskans we threw at those. Islands. Yeah. Them too. Uh, it's, it's basically, he is, uh, uh, a specter of the past of Japan's, uh, crimes coming back to enact revenge. And it's, it's, it's so weird, but it's, it's one of those like, well, yeah, no, it fits uh, after you, after you've turned this symbol of nuclear destruction into sort of a, a hero figure for about 30, 40 years. And then you have something like this. You turn him into a commodity. Yeah. You, you, you gave him Nikes. You, <laughs> you made him dumb. Yeah. He's scaly nuclear Mickey Mouse. Yeah. Uh, one of probably the most recognized icons outside of like a Mickey Mouse, a Michael Jackson. Uh, Pikachu. Pikachu, things like that. Uh, and, and instantly recognizable for like the terrors of nuclear disaster. But yeah, boyos, we are, we are wrapping up here. Oh, okay. The third wish. I was going to ask about that. I know. It took us a while to get to the second wish and it took us a while to get to the third. But our third wish is... Uh, for the nuclear genie is peace. And it's interesting because this is a story that is still somewhat going on. So far in our story, as of 2024, we've achieved somewhat peace. Nuclear weapons changed 
warfare after they have come out. This not in support, not in support of these, but but we moved immediately into smaller proxy wars, not big countries facing off against one another, not using these weapons in any sort of military fashion. Uh, it's 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 an ongoing test and an ongoing trial. It's it's peace, but for how long? Yeah. I mean, we just haven't ended each other in nuclear fire yet due to mutually assured destruction, but like. We definitely don't have peace, like you know. No, no, all. no, no. We we definitely we we have lowercase pee <laughs> <laughs> peace. Peace, peace, peace from from nuclear weapons. I mean, we haven't had like a Pakistan and India attack each other, you know, using any sort of their nuclear arsenal I in, in many of their conflicts. Or I mean, we have peace in the same way that like Kylie Jenner offering the cops a Pepsi ended like fucking police violence and. <laughs> Civil well, unrest. There is something to be said about this because peace used to be defined as the time in between wars. And you always knew there would be another war. That's what peace used to be defined as. But now peace for us, our generation, is defined as the time now where there is no grand wars happening. There's no declared world wars where we have no draft to have to sign up to go off to war to protect our country. We are more so in peace now than humanity's ever been in. Although there are still guns firing and bombs going off in places. And on, the, uh, and on the other foot, we are more in conflict yeah, than my, the world has ever seen before. My dear but listener, we, America today dropped a bunch of fucking bombs throughout Iraq and Syria. And in a way, it, it kind of proves a Fermi right. Uh, Fermi lived to see the ramifications of his thermonuclear bomb affect civilians yet again, nine years after the atomic bombings of Japan. Uh, he died, I believe in uh, December of 1954 of stomach cancer because again, being around all these radioactive elements, he had inoperable cancer basically as a, as the fallout from that. I mean, but again, with your Fermi paradox so far, We've had the ability to essentially salt the earth, make you know, kill kill all sea life, everything, kill each other, uh, give give everyone enough cancers ten times over, and like ninety percent of life on Earth. Yeah, there'll always be something. Earth always prevails. You're not in getting tardigrades. Yeah. No life. Uh, ha ha. Finds a way. But so far, we have we haven't proved Fermi correct. We haven't completely destroyed ourselves yet. So I, I leave this episode on a very melancholy note. There's been a lot of scares, but thankfully, like, there's been enough people that have just didn't want to be the guy that pulled the trigger uh, enough. This episode is essentially four smaller episodes in a trench coat. And I thank you both for, for going along this journey with oh, me. The box is opened. And much like a nuclear reaction, this story started small and kept on spiraling out of control for me. Those was gonna be a multi was gonna be a multi part episode at some point, and there may be a part two to this, but I, I can't guarantee it because uh uh behind the scenes a lot of this research is very harrowing. To, to bring some images to make us all laugh on the screen. So well, I don't I can know. Imagine. I can imagine. I mean, you're not talking about the Teletubbies here. You're talking about nuclear war. I mean, as, as I've been texting my significant other, like, I can't wait to do a happy episode after this. Oh, yeah, I, I, got one. I can't I got wait. I can't wait. Pocket. I can't wait to do an episode where just one man is mangled by the monorail at Disneyland. And I'm not talking about radiation damage. Like, to the whole peoples. <laughs> I promise no one's dying of premature cancer. And whenever I review like the history of the fucking Camry or whatever comes next. But thank you, boyos. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank this is a good episode. I really like this one. 